No, we don't have to leave. But tomorrow, maybe? Good morning. I am Patsy Lewis, the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It's good to have a few people in the room, but it's also great that we're still in COVID mode where we can invite those of you who would not normally be here with us in person to join us for this our second conference, Histories of Migration and Violence in Latin America. This conference is a second in the Mellon-funded Sawyer Seminar, Rethinking the Dynamic Interplay of Migration, Race, and Ethnicity in the Caribbean and Latin America, which is a collaboration between the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and the Africana Studies Department, Rights and Reason Theater here at Brown. I take this opportunity to acknowledge my co-collaborators, Tony Bokes, as a Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, and Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and Brian Meeks, who is actually in the room with us, Professor of Africana Studies and former chair of that department. I also welcome Ed Steinfeld, Professor of Political Science, and Dean's Professor of China Studies, and Howard R. Swearer, Director of the Thomas J. Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, in which Clax is housed. Migration is one of the big issues of our time, and of course there are many, and while the largest movement of people involving the region was to North America, over 25 million in 2020, Migration across borders within the region is a burning concern, though not always intuitively grasped in North America. Data drawn from the latest International Organization of Migration report suggests that a substantial number of migrants in the region, some 11 million, originated from countries within the region. The region is also the site of the second largest number of populations displaced across boundaries, of course, because of Venezuela, after Syria. The vast majority of Venezuelan migrants, 85%, or 4.6 million or 5.6 million people, moved to another country in Latin America and the Caribbean. Both countries, Syria and Venezuela, may well be surpassed by Ukrainians fleeing Russian invasion, even though their plight may not have attracted the global attention and empathy that the Ukraine refugee crisis has seen. While violence continues to be a major source of dislocation, climate change is increasingly a factor, accounting for most of the new internal displacement in the region in response to disasters, in particular hurricanes. COVID and tighter controls on the movement of people across borders have led to increased discrimination and hardships for migrants, stranding many in transit. The burden of caring for migrants tends to fall disproportionately on some countries, for example, Colombia and Panama, as restrictions have forced migrants to pass through the Darien Gap on the border of the two countries, which the International Organization of Migration describes as one of the most perilous, perilous migration routes globally. Increasingly, these perilous journeys are undertaken by children and women. In addition, women's representation in migration has increased substantially. They now comprise more than half of South American migrants to Argentina and Chile, the largest destination countries. Given Panama's location in migration flows, especially migrants in transit to other countries, it is more than fitting that our keynote speaker is the Panamanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency, Mrs. Erica Moynez. Welcome, Minister Moynez. We are very happy to have you. This conference represents, presents a range of issues covering different disciplinary perspectives. These include art, music, and performance, and literature, 
and community engagement alongside traditional disciplines such as history, political science, anthropology, and sociology. They explore how attitudes toward race, gender, sexuality, language, class, and social status determine, determine migrant experiences across a range of countries. And of course, the way we see what are desirable migrants and undesirable migrants. And these countries that we explore these two, over these two days are Brazil, Honduras, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Argentina, the Dutch Caribbean, Ghana, Haiti, among others. Given the urgency of Venezuelan migration, a large number of presenters focus on this group and their experiences in different countries. But such contemporary experiences are explored alongside a longer historical arc, such as the migrations of the Garifuna in Central America. This is the second, as I mentioned before, of two conferences on migration that we have held under the auspices of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar on Migration. The first was held last November under the theme Migration, Race, and Development in Latin America, and is now available on our YouTube channels of Clax and Watson. This conference would not have been possible without the guidance of our steering committee and the heavy lifting of our conference committee led by our Sawyer Seminar Postdoctoral Fellow, Dr. Kristen Collins, our Seminar Sawyer Graduate Proctors, Alexandria Miller and Karen DePaula Motor, Watson Director's Fellow, Frank Batista Kuhnhardt, Clax Center Manager, Kate Goldman, and Director of <coughs> Undergraduate Studies, Erica Durante. I also owe a special thanks to our Clark student assistant, who is on the podium, Felipe Felix Mendez, who played a key role in identifying Minister Moines as keynote speaker and helping us to get in touch with her. Be, uh, it is now my pleasure to invite Professor Steinfeld to say a few words. Thanks so much, Patsy. Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It's so good to see a number of colleagues and friends here in person in the audience, and it's equally great to be able to share this event with so many of you on, online. It, it's really my pleasure, it's actually my honor, to celebrate the start of the 2022 Mellon Sawyer Seminar Conference on Histories of Migration and Violence in Latin America and the Caribbean. Like you, Patsy, I, I, on this topic, have been thinking, of course, as many of us have, about Ukraine and um, the particular situation involving millions of people um, fleeing violence in Ukraine and moving on into neighboring countries like Poland and Hungary and Romania. Of course, in Ukraine, the violence is of a particular kind. It's one of invasion, of great power conflict, of empire, and it's, of course, brutally displaced millions of people and in a very positive way, despite centuries of enmity between Poland and Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees, also as Patsy mentioned, have been, at least up to this point, met generally with welcome and generosity and, and empathy. We know, though, that um, in that very same part of the world, Hungary, Poland, Romania, in recent years, that kind of generosity and empathy and absence of violence hasn't been the norm. We've seen very different kinds of responses to humans, men, women, children, families who are displaced by conflict in other parts of the world, like Syria or Afghanistan. Um, they were met in that same part of the world I mentioned really by state violence and civil violence in many cases and, and rejection. Indeed, historically in that part of the world, comparable patterns of violence against those fleeing, fleeing conflict have been repeated over and over. And we know, of course, again, that those kinds of patterns of violence on the reception of individuals fleeing violence, that's also been true here in North America on the United States' southern border. That's very much part of our history. And I mention all of this simply to underscore, at least in my view, that the phenomena that you are examining in the next two days, they're clearly not isolated to Latin America and the Caribbean. They're, of course, critical in Latin America and the Caribbean, but not isolated to that region, nor are they isolated, of course, to the global south. And I say all of that really to emphasize 
my view at least, that what you are doing today and tomorrow is extremely important for understanding a region, for understanding Latin America and the Caribbean, but it's equally important, or maybe even more important, for helping people in other parts of the world, including in North America and Europe and elsewhere, understand their own experience. In other words, the kind of work that is being done in this conference by CLACS, by the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, by the Department of Africana Studies, in my view, is really leading the way to what we aspire to do at Watson, which is to study critical phenomena in a globally comparative but deeply regional fashion that will encourage us all globally to be much more self-reflective, to be much more cognizant of the kinds of problems that surround us, and to be much more cognizant of the potential solutions to these problems, solutions that may not come from Western Europe and may not come from North America, but may very well come and indeed are coming in many cases from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so let me just conclude by again expressing my admiration for what you're all doing and my thanks to what you're doing and especially thanks to the institutions that are really leading this conference, and that's the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and the Department of Africana Studies. I look forward to learning from you all in the next two days. Thank you. Before I invite Felipe, Felix Mendez to introduce our keynote speaker. I would like to just say a few words to introduce him. I already said that he's one of our research assistants, um, undergraduate research assistants at CLAX, but Felix is also a senior from Panama here at Brown University. Felipe will graduate in May with a BA expected to be in honors, with honors, in international and public affairs and Latin American and Caribbean studies. He has completed internships at the Atlanta Council and the Permanent Mission of Panama to the United Nations. So Felipe, I now invite you to introduce Minister Moines. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you so much to Professor Steinfeld for those really inspiring words. Good morning, everyone. Professor Lewis, thank you very much for your kind introduction. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Erika Moines, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Panama. Minister Moines has over 10 years of experience in law, business, and government in both New York and Panama. In New York, she worked on structuring infrastructure projects with multilateral agencies and in investment negotiations in European and Latin American financial markets. Between 2013 and 2017, she served as general counsel and chief legal officer for FinTech Advisory, the investment manager of a multi-million dollar portfolio. Between 2007 and 2013, she was a senior lawyer of project finance at Sherman and Sterling, LLP. In Panama, she worked in the corporate and litigation practice of different law firms, and in 2004, she was appointed chief of staff to the Minister of Commerce and Industry. In 2019, she was appointed as Vice Minister of Multilateral Affairs and Cooperation of the Foreign Ministry. Her Excellency Erika Moines has received numerous international recognitions, including the Association of Corporate Councils Top 10 Award in 2015. She is a member of several nonprofit organizations, such as Kangu, a platform for maternal health care in Africa, sponsored by the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and other organizations. She was an honors graduate from San Agustin School and carried out parallel studies at two universities, Santa Maria La Antigua Catholic University, USMA, earning a bachelor's degree in law and political science, and the Latin American University for Science and Technology, ULACIT, earning a bachelor's degree in business administration, both with magna cum laude honors in 2000. Minister Moines holds a master's degree in corporate law from New York University and a master's degree in international law from the University of California at Berkeley. She also obtained a postgraduate degree in business and finance from the New York University as a Fulbright Fellow. Minister Moines was born in Panama on November 24, 1977. She is married and has two children. Minister Moines, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Brown University. Thank you. 
Hello, it is a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I would like to start by thanking Professor Luis and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies for inviting me to kick off what I'm sure will be a fascinating and timely conference. As Minister of Foreign Affairs, I have the privilege and the honor to represent the Republic of Panama to the world. And one of my favorite parts of doing this job is introducing Panama to the next generation of leaders, especially young people like yourselves, who play a critical role in instilling change and upholding the key democratic principles that have guided our countries today. Our two countries share a close and long-standing partnership. Panama is a strategic hub for trade to the United States, with 60% of goods transiting the Panama Canal going to or from U.S. markets. But our relationship goes way beyond just trade and logistics. Today, we're strong partners working together on some of the most important issues of our time. From climate change, to vaccine distribution, to gender equality, and strengthening democracy in the Western Hemisphere. One of the issues where the U.S. and Panama cooperation is most visible is migration, which is the focus of today's discussion. Last year, nearly 140,000 irregular migrants crossed Panama from South America, more than 10 times the number of migrants we see in a typical year. Many of these individuals were women and children. Most were traveling to the United States. At this time last year, Panama was sounding the alarm on what would become one of Latin America's largest humanitarian emergencies in recent years. And I'd like to share with you how this situation came to be, the steps that Panama took to address this crisis through a humanitarian approach, and how we're working with the United States and other partners to address the root causes of migration, which drive people to leave their homes in the first place. When I talk to my American colleagues about migration in Central America, many people think of migration coming from the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. But as the unprecedented number of migrants that passed through Panama last year shows, this isn't just an issue relegated to the Northern Triangle. Panama usually receives about 10,000 migrants in a typical year. And this number declined due to border restrictions that were imposed across Latin America to stop the spread of COVID-19. When the restrictions were lifted in 2021, many migrants seized the opportunity to travel north. Some were driven by natural disasters, others by devastating effects of the pandemic, while others just search in search of economic opportunities and a better life for themselves and for their families. In particular, chronic instability in Haiti has forced many Haitians to leave their homes in recent decades. More than 82,000 Haitians traveled through Panama last year. 80% who had first migrated to Chile and other South American countries where they were unable to find long-term security. This situation only worsened in 2021 as Haiti endured another earthquake and more political and economic turmoil, forcing more citizens to flee their homes in search of safety and a better life. Many migrants were targeted and taken advantage by criminal smuggling networks who robbed families of their savings, downplayed the dangers of the journey to the United States, and lied about what migrants would be exposed once they arrived. Taken together, these factors contributed to the unprecedented numbers of people crossing from South America into Panama at the beginning of 2021. By the end of last year, Panama had received nearly 140,000 migrants, more than 10 times what we usually expect in a typical year, and daily numbers that were growing quickly. 20% of these migrants were minor, and 80% of those minors were under the age of five. 
from the beginning, Panama recognized the urgency of the situation and the need to collaborate across the region to take an effective and humanitarian crisis uh, approach to the crisis. We established a two-pronged strategy along those lines. The first part of the strategy has been focused on raising global awareness of the crisis to drive regional collaboration and provide humanitarian assistance to the thousands of migrants, many of them children that I just mentioned, cross, crossing our borders. The second part is aimed at the root causes driving the search of irregular migration and collaborating with our counterparts in the regions to address them. I'll focus on Panama's humanitarian response, response to the situation first. Most migrants arrived in Panama having traveled to multiple countries and arrived at a dangerous jungle known as the Darien Gap, which stresses, uh, stretches across from the border with Colombia. This jungle is so dense that it's considered one of the most inhospitable environment in the world. Until recently, most migrants never tried to cross the Indian jungle. It served as a natural barrier between our continents. Last year, however, with instability pushing them north and organized criminal groups encouraging their passage, migrants started undertaking an extremely dangerous route from Colombia through the Darien, through the Darien Gap to Panama. They arrive in our country eight days later, malnourished and in terrible conditions. Panama is often the first country along the migration route to use our limited resources to give migrants food, shelter, medical care. For example, we had one case of a little girl that had contracted yellow fever in Brazil, passed through several countries on her way north, but, all, but no country had given her any kind of medical assistance or even recorded her infection until she arrived in Panama. We're also often the first country to provide migrants with biometric testing and background checks, which plays a critical role in helping nations to our north track and understand migration flows. This is also critical as we can spot potential bad actors and work with the authorities to deport them back to their home countries. The international NGOs and partner organizations play a critical humanitarian role too. For example, the Gorgas Memorial Institute for Health Studies, one of Panama's premier health research institutions, is conducting a study to the, the broad health needs of migrants traveling through Panama to improve detection of tropical diseases among migrant populations. However, even with the help of international organizations like Red Cross, the sheer number of people passing through Panama last year surpassed our capacity to provide migrants with the care they need and deserve. This brings me to the second part of our strategy, working with our regional partners to tackle the root causes of migrations. With more migrants entering our country through the Darien every day, Panama convened a regional ministerial summit on migration in August of 2021 to address the emergency. This was the first meeting of its kind ever with when the migration levels had previously spiked, no other country had organized the region's leader to address this problem holistically. Officials from 10 countries, including the US, attended the summit to coordinate on a technical and strategic measures to better control the flow of regular migrants passing through Latin America en route to the US. This included a meeting of the region's attorney generals and fiscals to collaborate on legal actions to dismantle these criminal cartels that I was referring to. Recognizing that international criminal groups were fueling the crisis by taking advantage of migrants, Panama has worked closely with Colombia, with Costa Rica and other partners, including international organizations such as the Interpol to tackle this issue as a matter of top priority. We have since then dismantled several criminal smuggling networks responsible for perpetuating this crisis. As I mentioned earlier, the United States is one of Panama's most important partners in addressing the root causes of migration. 
The U.S. has provided security and intelligence assistance that has been invaluable to our fight against those cartels. I am encouraged by the close relationship we have formed with members of the Biden administration and meetings that I've had with members of Congress to raise awareness of the situation and identify areas for cooperation. Just earlier this month, I met with Secretary of State Blinken to discuss the progress that we have made working towards the, improving the situation, as well as the step the U.S. and Panama can take together on the work that remains to be done. Panama has also prioritized cooperation closer to home. We know that natural disasters are one of the root causes driving people from their home countries. So when an earthquake struck Haiti last August, for example, Panama was one of the first countries to send aid in coordination with other countries in the region. We also activated the rapid response protocol of Panama's Regional Logistics Center for Humanitarian Assistance, which is one of six of such facilities worldwide and the only one based in the Americas. Working with the OAS and other partners, we leverage our strategic geographic position and logistical infrastructure to manage, store, and redistribute international aid bound for Haiti. We've explored ways to target the root causes of migration through regional diplomacy too. Late last year, Panama, Costa Rica, and Dominican Republic for, forged the Alliance for Development in Democracy to foster cooperation between our countries, strengthen our democratic institutions, and unlock economic opportunities for our people and our region. Migration is one of those areas this group can have an outsized impact. A World Food Program study published last year found that the lack of economic opportunity in migrants' home countries was one of the primary factors driving migration from Central America. Through the alliance, Panama, Costa Rica, and Dominican Republic will align our foreign policies to tackle this program. This problem, coordinating with our regional partners to reduce instability and create better economic opportunities for people across the region. This brings me to where we are today. I'm proud to say that Panama's diplomatic and legal approach coordinated with our regional partners has delivered results. We've seen the daily average number of migrants passing through Panama go from 2,400 to 140 a day. And we've strengthened mechanisms to cooperate with the U.S. and other partners in the process. This reduction in numbers has allowed us to provide better care to those migrants who, who are going through without overwhelming our facilities. For example, we've been staffing our migration <laughs> reception centers with OBGYNs and vaccination programs against COVID and other diseases. We're grateful to countries like the United States, Colombia, Costa Rica, all who were key partners in our efforts to address the immediate crisis. We're also grateful to organizations such as the OAM who stepped to assist during the peak of this crisis. While we're optimistic about the future, we're also very vigilant, and these numbers could increase at any times in the months ahead. And it would be critical to continue working together to address the root causes of, uh, that have forced the migrants to leave their homes in the first place. Addressing the root causes of migration will be the key focus of Panama's looking ahead to the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles uh, this June. To conclude, I want to emphasize that Panama's experience has shown how international cooperation is key to address the defining challenges of our time. Just as no one nation can resolve the root causes of irregular migration, no one country can tackle climate change or overcome the pandemic on its own. It takes a coalition of countries working together to make real differences on the issues that matter most. Young people, especially like you, have an important role to play regarding how we can help and, and help us see past through our differences and hold today's leaders accountable 
to future generations. Thank you for having me here today to share more about Panama's approach to this critically important issue. I look forward to the rest of the conference. That, that we had prepared. So, Minister Moines, as you said, Panama hosted a ministerial meeting with representatives from 10 countries to discuss the migration crisis in the region and how to respond to it. I would like to hear you elaborate on the measures that were agreed upon and perhaps provide a progress update on how the crisis is going since you said that last year there were around 140,000 um, migrants, irregular migrants, in the Darien Gap. Sure. Um, so the update, it's, I think, very positive. As I mentioned, we went from 2,400 at our border on a daily basis um, last August when we convened the high-level meeting to today where we're averaging 140. And I think it's positive because at the end, what you want to do is it's be able to supply the and provide the support that those migrants need when they're going through. We are, as I mentioned so far, the only country that has this sort of holistic approach of not only providing food and shelter, but the medical support that they all need and to get them back uh, on their feet and supported because, as, they, as I mentioned, they typically arrive malnourished in Panama. And having numbers such as 140 a day, it's a lot more manageable for Panama than what the previous surge that had been. Um, mind you, they arrived first in a little town called Bajo Chiquito in Panama. Bajo Chiquito itself is about 300 people. We were at a point where, on a daily basis, we're, arri we're arriving 2,400 to that small town. So you can imagine how the overflow of our capacities or even support the migrants had, had gone out of control. And now we're in a much more manageable position. Thanks again, Minister Moines. Um, it's really great to have you um, speak with us. We really appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule. I wanted to ask if you see or you can tell us some of the concrete differences in policy between the last administration and the current administration that you think might make a real difference to the bottleneck of, migra of migrants passing through um, Central America into the US. Thank you. Do you want me to comment on the different policies of the U.S.? I think basically, do you see a difference? Do you see a, a, a difference in the Biden administration's policies that would actually make a difference to the, the free move, freer movement of people and avoid the challenges that you have with migrants being backed up, who, whose des final destination is not Panama? or any of yeah. the surrounding countries? Um, I, I, I can't comment on the specifics of one administration versus the other, so we can comment on ours, but I will um, comment on how we think it is helpful. And the first thing is not avoiding, not um, thinking that it will go away, but rather understanding, raising awareness, um, uh, the, the movement, so the one that I was mentioning, the, the movement was mostly Caribbean and then also uh, a migration that we have from Africa that arrives in South America and then moves north, has been uh, doing this transit for decades, for over two decades. Um, it is different than the Northern Triangle migration and it is it needs its own attention. Um, it, we need awareness from everybody. It's not going to go away just on its own. Um, the root causes, as I mentioned, for instance, the, the crisis that is happening in Haiti uh, needs to be addressed. And, and the, the most important part that we think is relevant, it's all working together. Um, no one country and no one can set the agenda on how we're going to manage this. Um, nor, nor it can share the responsibility on its own. 
Um, there, as I mentioned, it needs to be a multi-pronged approach and, and collectively. And that goes not only for migration, if I may, on Haiti, for instance, when you have multiple strategic partners trying to figure out what is the solution, but not one single action plan that we all can sort of engage, then it's also problematic. So the, the more that, that we are able to collaborate and discuss sort of this regional approach and understand it, again, with awareness of what's going on, um, the more effective we're going to be. As a reminder to the audience, we would love to see your questions in the chat and through the Q&A feature. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to drum some of your questions that we have prepared. Um, Minister Moines, you recently met, as you said, with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and with other senior officials in the Biden administration. We would love to hear um, some of the, what was the outcome of that meeting and where do you see U.S. partnership with Panama and other regional partners going forward on the issue of migration? So we we did kind of um, an evaluation of where we were where when I, as I mentioned Panama started sounding the alarm of our concern of the migrants uh, that uh, the management and how we were dealing and I some of the issues that we mentioned is how we can all share more now that it's a bit more under control in this humanitarian approach it cannot be that Panama right now is the only country providing food or providing medical support or the biometric testing and that we're able to detect criminals after they've gone through five countries and it's only in Panama we're able to detect them. So um, we are trying, it's a good sort of um, brief test if you like or, 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 or um, time to make sure that every single country from the US to Brazil to Peru to Colombia everybody uh, understands uh, this humanitarian approach that needs to be able and, uh, and available to these migrants and how we're also discussing, as I mentioned, some of those critical root causes uh, uh, of migration, which are, for instance, in this case, Haiti. The, the problem when you try to deal sort of on a, cri on a crisis basis is that the help is also like that, sort of this peak, and then it's not sustainable. On the case of Haiti, you, we saw a lot of mobilization of resources when the earthquake happened, but not sustainable ones. They don't need charity. They don't need sort of a one-off uh, approach or, or help. They need a sustainable program that can last many years and that can uh, have a significant impact on the well-being, security, uh, basic needs that need to be met in order for them to have a better life. I think there's a question in the back, no? Okay. Yes, there's a question in the chat from Professor Veronica Ingham. She says, thank you, Minister Moines, for your presentation. Can you please comment on what you see as the critical steps countries can take to address what you have called the root causes of migration in Latin America? So 80% um, of the migration that went through our borders was coming from Haiti. Um, as much as there are significant and extremely serious problems happening in other parts of the world, Haiti is our neighbor. Um, and. I think it requires a lot more attention from everybody as a community, understand that, that, that we need to come up with an action plan and, and the steps I, uh, um, need to be sort of organized in one single action plan. It cannot be one-off idea from Panama or the US or Canada. It needs to be sort of this coordinated effort. That's number one. Number two, um, the there is this element of criminal organizations that it's important to be this, that gets dismantled that right now it's organized in all of our countries we need to recognize it understand that um they these pervasive incentives and, and send them in a dangerous uh, route that they were not previously taken are in large part due to that 
there is no way of combating these international organizations, other uh, international criminal organizations, other than through sheer cooperation among all the countries. You will have one migrant um, going through Panama or Costa Rica and setting up or, um, a, a claim or saying, well, it's with this person, and then when you try to send it to court, the migrant has gone through and, and he's in another place. So unless you actually create this uh, investigations, coordinated and sharing information among the various uh, judicial authorities of each country, you're not able to truly be effective. We've done, I think, uh, great steps towards that direction. There's still a lot more and we can, we can understand, we have the numbers on wh where the migrants are drawing money and, and it's extremely sad how much money they end up paying to these organizations in the various points along the route. Um, so I think that the more that we can tackle this, um, the more effective that will be. Yes, we have a question in the back, Professor Erika Durante. Uh, hi, Minister. Thank you so much for being here today and for being so clear about the policies and the situation in your country about migration. Um, so I, I, I was, um, I would like to re, uh, like go back to one element that you mentioned in your um, in your um, lecture, which is about the kind of population you are emphasizing the presence of children, women, and then programs of public health, OBGYN, uh, to receive also these migrants. So I was curious about if you could say more about the um, demographic of the, of the migrant population of these migrant communities that cross and come to Panama. Like if this is like a um, relatively regular pattern, maybe I am also thinking about what is happening in Ukraine and the current humanitarian crisis there and the uh, and the amount of women and children that are escaping from the country. So I was wondering whether, in the case of Panama, you, you for different reasons, obviously, you also see an important exodus mainly of women and children more than male migrants. And then also my other question was about uh, Venezuela, Venezuela, which is also the biggest humanitarian, one of the biggest humanitarian crises together with Haiti together with Ukraine today. So if you could say more maybe about this uh, additional neighboring country and your relationship um, with uh, Venezuelan refugees. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, first on the demographics. So um, there are a lot of women, and as I mentioned, 80 percent of the tw there are 20 percent that are minors, and out of those 20 percent, 80 percent are under the age of five. So there are a lot of small children. We have women here that are breastfeeding or that just gave birth, um, and you can imagine doing a, a transit of eight days through a jungle, uh, extremely difficult with baby on a, with a baby on the head. <laughs> but we've also noticed a lot of uh, migrants that come here with minors that are not related to them to get leniency from the authorities. Uh, so it's really hard, and, and I think Panama, it's, it's the first point of entry through their route where we do biometric testing. We do recognize that situation often, and it's super difficult because once we're able to determine that this adult woman or man um, it's carrying a child that is not related to him in any manner, then trying to find the family of that child is super difficult. Um, they stay here, we have a special shelter for them. Um, and again, in the 10 country route, it is the only country where, where right now we're trying to, to, to understand, support, and make sure that they're not being taken advantage. And we have seen the numbers of this type of situation and using, using children or caring children not related uh, spike in the recent months. And, and, and I, we have to assume, as, as, as I mentioned, part of the strategy to get more leniency. Um, and it, the women and, and children and men, um, all the stories are extremely difficult, sad. Um, I visit 
often the our migration shelters and uh, the women that have also uh, endured sexual abuse. I mean, there are a number of situations that go in this journey um, or that happen through them in this 10 uh, country journey uh, that, that make it extremely difficult and it's impressive to hear the determination and when, when we meet them and we try to support and say um, the only the only eagerness and the only thing that they keep on saying is just let me go, let me go. I want to keep on going. I want to get to the U.S. regardless of what they've gone through. So difficult to hear those stories, difficult to 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 understand the pain and the need that drove them in the first place. And and again, this is why it's extremely important to recognize and to understand that any approach to migration needs to be with a humanitarian lens and reminding that there is a story behind every single individual that is crossing um, all of our countries and, and a serious need that have driven them in the first place. Um, regarding Venezuela, yes, the numbers have gone up on Venezuela. So there was a large migration wave um, a few years ago, and now we're seeing the numbers again go up, uh, particularly from Venezuela. Cuba as well is another of the nationalities that we've seen the numbers increase. Um, and of course, the, the, as I mentioned, these are always sort of uh, driven by need and not by desire. And um, we expect the numbers, particularly on Venezuela, to continue rising. Minister Moines, have you been in discussions with the Caribbean community as Haiti is a member of the Caribbean community and, um, you know, the, the problems of, of that Haiti is experiencing that contributes to, my, that contribute to migration, um, obviously should be a concern of that grouping. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, increasingly, the CARICOM countries, especially Ghana and Trinidad, which are, you know, closest to, to Venezuela, are receiving increasing numbers of Venezuelan migrants. I was wondering if you had any lines of communication open with the Caribbean community, and if you think that if you don't have it, if that's worthwhile to pursue. Thank you. Yes, uh, I definitely have it. I've been very active engaging with each one of the countries and I have convened a meeting which will take place here in Panama with all the CARICOM countries. They'll be coming, all the Minister of Foreign Affairs, forget the date, I think it's 26th of April. Um, and we're going to meet here and one of the main topics of our discussion is precisely Haiti and how we can collaborate and, and as I mentioned again, not not this one-off idea, but rather as a community. Um, they are, as, a, uh, as CARICOM, already very concerned. They, they've established a task force to deal specifically with Haiti. And as you mentioned, on the case of Venezuela, which some countries are already receiving, migration as a whole or a more holistic approach is something that we ought to discuss with, with the CARICOM countries. Minister, you mentioned that Panama, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic have formed the informal bloc known as the Alliance for Development in Democracy. I am curious to hear what you see as the role of the Alliance for Development in Democracy in Panama's long-term strategy to address the migration crisis. Yeah, the, the idea that this informal mechanism, and I, I underscore the importance of saying informal because I think we have many um, organizations from the lateral platforms in Latin America, not all of them very effective. So this was not meant to be another one and appoint more people or have an office. So this is really an informal mechanism where, you know, through a chat or, or any means, reach out and try to coordinate positions, try to cooperate, try to engage uh, when we can uh, on the different issues. And then on migration, you have the Dominican Republic that is right next to Haiti, uh, Costa Rica and Panama were both passage countries and endure the, the or, or have the same view. Um, and then raising awareness, as I mentioned, is extremely important um, with 
the EU, with, with the United States, with, with the various uh, regional partners um, to try to convene in this um, a multilateral approach. Um, and so I think that having the footprint of different countries um, and organizing that so we're able to coordinate and engage with more partners, it's also very effective means to try to, to be aligned, right? To not have this one-off ideas. Thank you very much. We have, um, yeah, we have, we have one more question in the audience from Kristen Collins. Thanks again for being with us today, Mrs. Mike Um My question is, especially talking about these collaborations and collaborations across countries and things like that, if you could speak to collaborations that you might have with civil society or non-governmental organizations who are involved, especially with um, managing humanitarian aid and things like that. Thanks. Um, we, we are actively engaged and they've been, I think, very helpful in establishing. So we have now protocols on how, how you receive a migrant in the first place. How are you able to support them? Mind you, not, it is often the case where it will be a migrant that speaks, for instance, French, and it, I, even our authorities are not able to coordinate and they don't understand what's happening as they don't have shelters in any other place. So they don't even know that they're being, um, uh, address or, or, or send to a place where they'll be attended to. So I think it's been extremely helpful in establishing all this sort of framework, how you support them. We have now, for instance, we're creating a shelter specifically for children with activities directed towards children with a little small um, um, facility that has um, toys and all this. Um, support. We have um, volunteers that they've supported, and this is ACNUR, OEM, Red Cross, um, in how you support this, uh, these minors in, in this journey, the women. Um, so I think it's been helpful. I hope we can get more, frankly, because the this is not going to go away, and the 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 toll that they has taken on the limited resources coming out of the pandemic that Panama has is significant. Um, we have taken now, not only from our migration budget, uh, so, sorry, from the uh, authorities that deal with migration, but also we've taken away from our educational budget, from other types to support what's happening there. Um, and you know anything from like a meal, how do you support that meal or how you fund that? But I think that the, the, the collaboration is important and every bit of help that we've been getting has been crucial and we have them, uh, several of them stationed in the Darien or in the other side in Chiriqui, which is also extremely beneficial. Thank you very much. We have a question in the Q&A feature. Um, our guest asked, I am interested in knowing the physical logistics of Haitians coming to Panama. Are Haitians coming by boats to Panama or essentially by what other means of transportation? The, the normal way of transportation is your own feet. They arrive on foot um, and through the, the jungle. However, we are seeing that now they're starting to create alternative routes um, through the Pacific. Um, I know that the U.S. On, on their side, they're seeing some movements through water, but it's not the normal means. The normal means is people that go on foot and arrive uh, through the jungle. Um, both journeys, whether it's by water or on foot, are dangerous. These are not passages that were meant for, for that purpose. So, um, yes, difficult. Thank you very much, Minister Moines. Looks like those are all the questions that we have. Thank you so much for joining us today, for being so generous with taking time of your schedule. I believe um, Professor Patsy Lewis would like to say a few words to end. Thank you, Felipe. I just want to add my formal thank you to Minister Moines for really setting the stage for this conference and giving us some insights into 
how complex this this uh, problem is and the kind of challenges it throws up for countries. No doubt we'll be looking at the different responses across the region and it's great to have positive models of how to care uh, because we really need those. So I, again, I want to thank you so very much for spending the time to talk with us. So I know you have to leave, so we don't want to keep you, but you know, if you have the time and can check in at any time, we'd love to. Thank you, to thank you everybody, bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. I mentioned that we had uh, this, we have to thank the Sawyer Committee and I for steering committee for helping Kristen on, right? For helping um, guide us um, through the programs we're having under the, the Melon Sawyer uh, migration um, series. And I just wanted to name them, of course, they include our co-collaborators, Brian Meeks, Tony Bogues. They also include Jerry Augusto, Pablo Rodriguez, Andrea Flores, Rich Snyder, Lisa Biggs, Kevin Escudero, Patricia Figueroa, Maya Gamble Rivers. I also, we're also indebted to the panelists. There will be no conference without you. And I'm really grateful that you thought this was important enough to spend, you know, to, to contribute your time to us, and I really look forward to a rich engagement with you. Of course, it's always better when we have an audience, so we're not just talking among ourselves. So I really want to thank um, the members of our audience, and just to remind you that if you are at Brown, um, we are hanging out at the Joukowsky Forum, especially for our hybrid, our hybrid um, sessions. The next meeting, of course, just to remind you, you use the same Zoom link for the two days for all the panels, so to avoid any con confusion. We have today, I just want to flag two panels that we're having hybrid, and that would be a panel at 11.15, Performances of Absence and Healing Through Latin American and Caribbean Art, which features, features a number of Brown faculty members and grad students, uh, as well as a panelist on Zoom. This afternoon, we have an in-person exhibition, which is really exciting, and I apologize that we are not able to share this on Zoom, but we expect to have a digital iteration at some point. The exhibition is at Watson, the main Watson building, 111 Thea Street, and it's called Breaking Out Immigrant Art from Stewart Detention Center. And we, again, we, it, this is primarily the initiative of um, our postdoctoral fellow, Christian Stewart and we, Christian Collins, <laughs> my apologies. And of course, we have to thank um, the Art at Watson committee, including our own Erica Durante, um, Ali Martinez, for Ali, our student, for our, the most beautiful poster advertising that event. And so those of you here, we're hoping to see you later. So I think, again, we start tomorrow um, at 9 o'clock. So I look forward to, see, to seeing you at all the panels and again tomorrow. So until the 11.15... Bye and see you then. Thank again. Thank you guys so much for for being here.
communications team for allowing us to be heard and for everybody who has had a, a, um, some role in making these events possible. Thank you, John. <laughs>
but she was she's been with us up until a couple of months ago. But she's in that in that cave where she was like that. That's just you know, remind me of like her. So. Okay. Yeah. So the first three panelists are going to present in person, and then our final panelist is on Zoom. Okay. And there will be a PowerPoint? For, the, for two panelists, Amanda and Alexandria, are do, they have PowerPoints, but they're going to just stream them from their own computer Okay. Um, so that they can be seated here. And then um, Elad does not have one. And then Tanya, will, if she's on here, she'll do her own thing. Is that clear? <laughs> I'm not sure if all of my words came out in the clearest way, but okay. <laughs> so we know. Because you're talking just like yeah. this. How does it turn off? <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't understand that. It's just they control it. Oh, yeah. But there's an internet connection. And it's only the first floor, so. It's only the first floor, yeah. It's very rare, like, usually only the front of stage can be exposed. It's usually two nights where it's ten tiles or five tiles, and it's only for people that hold them. Amanda, you'll go first, then Ivan, and then Alexander. Yep. And then I'll read your bios like in between each one so that you have time to like share your screen, do what you need to do. And this is about 10 minutes? 10 15.
Um, can you unmute us? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna bring this up. Hi everyone, um, and welcome. We are back to our program, so welcome back to um, Histories of Migration and Violence in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're gonna get started with our um, awesome 1115 panel called Performances of Absence and Healing Through Latin America and, and Caribbean Art. And so today we have um, three presenters here in person with us, um, all uh, Brown graduate students and faculty, and then we'll have one presenter that'll join us in our hybrid format online. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'll um, introduce uh, all the panelists briefly right here at the beginning and then read their bios um, as they share their presentations. So uh, we'll first hear from Amanda Macedo Macedo, who is a graduate student here at Brown University. Then we'll hear from uh, Ivan Ramos, who is a faculty member here at Brown. And then Alexandra Miller, another grad student and co-organizer of today's events. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from um, Tanya Guinega, who is an artist um, working on Cast of the Border. So uh, first, we are going to hear from Amanda, um, who is a PhD student here in the Theater, Arts, and Performance Studies Department. She holds an MA in Communication from the Graduate Program in Political and Social Sciences at the UNAM in Mexico. And she is currently interested in practices of persistence and refusal, disruptive pasts and alternative presence, the body and space in context of violence. Her areas of research include performance studies, feminist theory, visual culture, decolonial studies, and post-colonial thought. So we will go ahead and hear from Amanda. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you everybody for the organizers and I'm glad to be here in person at uni, home. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, I sh already shared it. So I'll, I'll go ahead with my presentation. Um, and the name of my presentation is called Lines and Sound, Brown Affective Communities. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the work of Guadalupe Maravilla, who is an artist that immigrated to the United States from El Salvador as an accompanied child when he was eight years old. Maravilla is also a survivor of cancer. And it is important to mention these biographical facts in his body of work approaches his personal trauma. Through multisensorial sculptures, drawings, and performances, he connects his personal narrative to a collective one. In this case, the trauma is a consequence of experiences that are linked to brownness. Brownness is the perseverant endurance in adverse conditions of being. The work of Maravilla is a brown utterance. It results from persevering through the negation of being in a world where certain bodies are not allowed to exist. Echoing J. O. Austin notion of a performative utterance, the performance theorist Jose Esteban Muñoz writes of a brown, brown utterance as, quote, a still nascent articulation of a particular mode of belonging in difference, particularity for, particularly for people who feel brown, for people who know their self and recognize each other through a particular, through a particular negation. A negation that is enacted by failing to conform to the affected protocols of normative cultural citizenship, end quote. The work of Maravilla goes beyond the experience of migration and displacement. There is a stickiness of this effect that binds the brown utterance and makes it expansive. The assumption of being alive despite a geography that once you did is in the core of brownness. He renders visible the ungraspable experience of non-belonging, which is an ethnic and anti-normative effect. There is a direct reading of Maravilla's work, a literal one, one that could be considered distracting. In this case, I'm accounting for the distraction as a strategy that veils the layers of meaning. The excess is hiding something, the obvious. A direct legibility is concealing a different interpretation, one that demands a brown attunement to the cross-temporal environment created by Maravilla. But first, we must engage with this excess as a way of moving through the direct distracting reading. I first, I first encountered Maravilla's work at the Jark Bar Barrett Gallery in New York in 2020. The gallery is, as many other galleries, a small white box di divided in three rooms. Um, this is the work that I first uh, 
caught my attention, and I won't describe it because you can see it. Uh, it is formed by the juxtaposition of three-dimensional elements pointing in many directions. Most of Maravilla's sculptures, I later found out, are shrines. The artist conceives them as healing machines. The large-scale sculptures are titled disease throwers and function as headdresses, instruments, and shrines through the incorporation of materials collected from sites across Central America, anatomical models, and sonic instruments such as conch shells and gongs. And here it's important to underline the, the way that sounds come into the pieces, even though we cannot see them. There's like always something sonic present. Uh, the rest of the artworks in the gallery were, uh, were also like a juxtaposition of fragile elements, a combination of organic and inorganic brown matter, maps drawn in paper, color symbols painted on tortillas attached to the canvas, precarious elements that were part of Maravilla's journey. In his artworks, there is no disconnection between the human and the non-human, between the individual and the communal. It's not only about the personal journey, but about the formation of diasporic commons, a communal investment. Munoz writes, Brown, Commons is meant to signify at least two things. One is the commons of brown people, places, feelings, sounds, animals, minerals, flora, and other objects. How these things are brown or what makes them brown is partially the way which they suffer and strive together, but also the commonality of their ability to flourish under duress and pressure. But they are also brown insofar as they smolder with life and persistence. They are brown because brown is a common color shared by a common that is of and for the multitude and I end quote. Maravilla describes making multiple journeys to places he crossed as a child to recollect the materials. I argue that this practice is a reconstruction of the brown commons, bringing the past into the future, redoing the journey and collecting objects that belong both to the past and the future. The gathering of materials is constitutive, not accumulative. Even though these elements are part of the evocation of his border crossing, they are material or immaterial remains that belong or constitute brownness or brown commons. Through what I call meditation, my own attunement to Maravilla's work, a practice of affective labor that allows the emergence of a disruptive and transformative potential, I argue that the fragility and roughness of the vernacular objects, their materiality, but also their degradation, is an allusion to Latin America, and the reaccommodation of the objects is a recycling of meaning and belonging. I want to engage with the potentiality of that Maravilla enacts via sound. Sound of healings, sounds produced by the headdresses. Engaging a moment as past and yet present opens the possibility to readdress time, a recollection. This constitutive move regenerates a mythology that allow allows us to inhabit our present with our, lives, with our eyes looking backwards and walking towards the future. Here, the temporal spatial dimensions are constantly redone one after another. <coughs> the past is not something that we can know directly. It is through our own experience that we engage with the wounds of history. Relations that emerge among us, identifications marked and unmarked by history, what I call brown mythologies. To move to beside from my paranoid reading, I had to ac account for my Dutch and anticipatory misconception. What ways of being were invoked by Maravilla's work? Why was I feeling of, I, what was that feeling of I get itness as an important part of generation of meaning? Engaging with the work in a different manner required a meditative practice. The I get itness was a prior moment to the realization that there is intentionality among the connection to the elements and narrative to create a space that doesn't belong, but where you belong. I recognize the material and immaterial elements and the elements recognize me. One mutual, once mutual recognition is achieved, the sense of division between the environment and self is dissolved. Another possibility is beyond completeness become available. As Munoz writes, quote, brownness is about contact and is nothing like continuousness, end quote. The most powerful things are often the overlooked ones, the ostensibly irrelevant. The Tripachuca lines offer me the possibility to sense brownness through memory and imagination. They gave me another scale of experience. I had a personal connection to the game. As a child, I played the Tirpachuca game with my mother. I remember the labyrinthic drawings and the spontaneity of the game. And here are the lines that are actually the Tirpachuca drawings that are present in every, in every Maravilla's work. 
The game consists of writing a set of pair numbers in a piece of paper. The pairs are joined with a curved line without detaching the pencil from the paper. It is played in consecutive turns. The first player joins the number with his pair, and the second player until you finish joining all, all the objects without touching any other line in the paper. This is a result, uh, this results as a labyrinthic drawing of adjacent lines. Meditation plays a fundamental role in, the, in apprehending what his work is about. Meditation allows us to be moved. Memory carries a sense of place in this act of remembering. The, the, the Tripatruca lines then, I argue, carry place. The collaborative act of uh, aspect of Maravilla's Tripatruca lines are a depiction of what Munoz refers, quote, feeling together in difference, end quote. Whenever the artist shows his work, he invites a person who shares the migrant experience and while playing the game with him and drawing the lines across the gallery or other open spaces, uh, the Tripatruca lines uh, hold these elements of like generating a mythology that cannot be reduced to a given identity, but is on the contrary, a disruptive practice of recreating the world through brownness, where we get to understand the contours of ourselves in a non-fixed place. Understanding places as context is to recognize that there is no essence or universal structure of place. The game generates a complex relation between memory and community that is not fixed to a space, but rather to an evolving narrative. By means of calls and response, and whoever is, and whoever is playing, uh, Maravilla and whoever is playing generate a narrative of spiritual space, a haunted space, a space for hope. A place that once inhabit and share can become inhabit again and again in difference, moving beyond geographies and place. The crossing geographies, visible remains, are the labyrinthic drawings. The lines are equally vulnerable, calls in search of responses, interanimating, animating, expansive. As Henry Lafelf writes, quote, the present sometimes imitates the, to the point of mistaking itself for presence, a portrait, a copy, a double, a facsimile, etc. But a presence survives and imposes itself by introducing a rhythm, a time. End quote. The geographies are shaped by a recollection of utopian gestures, constantly moving from one body to over another, utopian gestures that are provisional, incomplete, reaching, extending. They generate a motion, a force that allows place to travel and stretch across time. Sound brings the body home. The body returns to the world as vibration. Through his artistic practice, lines and sound open a portal where the past and present collide, but the future is a utopia that we have yet to experience. The labyrinthic lines are a cartography in which repetition, time, and reconfi reconfiguration of space allow the formation of affected communities. The game and the healing rituals are a site of connection and intimacy. Utopian gestures move towards the horizon of a world that is already here. For Jean-Luc Nancy, quote, to touch something is to make contact with it even while remaining separated from it because entities that touch do not fuse together, end quote. Maravillous crossing geographies invoke the sense of brown in this place where we come close to each other but remain in difference. The lines touch the same space, space but never fuse. In these crossing geographies, we become close to each other, not touching, but moving. We heal our, ones, our wounds together, but we keep our secrets to ourselves. I argue that the utopian gestures of the artist unveil brown as a commonality of feeling like a problem and point toward a horizon where we may find a commonality that is not yet here. Munoz writes, the city is not just an enclosure of nature, but its own, its own commons that it's teeming with the potentiality for the kind of living otherwise, the kind that a full engagement with the commons might help actualize, end quote. This is what Munoz sketched as a collectivity with and through the incommensurable. Thinking and feeling critically about space and place encourage us to open the senses of a commonality to through vulner vulnerability, meditation, and play. Considering Ernst Bloch's principle of hope, it remains possible for me to seek out and affirm that crossing geographies are world-making collective processes. Bloch writes, nothing could be altered in accordance with wishes if the world were closed, full, or fixed, even if perfect facts. Instead of Instead of this, there are simply processes, example, dynamic relationships within, within the become that has not completely triumphed. The real is the process, the latter is the widely rea 
ramified meditation between present, unfinished past, and above all possible future. End quote. The utopian gestures of Maravilla work of Maravilla's work regenerate what Munoz refers, quote, a provisional immutuality, a product friction, an incomplete touching that add up to the sense of the world. The world itself is rebelling. What we see now and how we experience it will change over time. Attuning to brownness requires an, an ongoing affective labor that unfolds a particular world. Maravilla's practices ancient and indigenous knowledge to create new rituals of healing to create textured soundscapes, again, call and response. Sound materializes as touch, a sound that exists exist the so-called limits of human experience. Body limits blur, the body becomes porous, receptive. Sound affects, and through this effect, the communality shape, vibration, call and response. Yesterday, I played the game again with my friend, crossing geographies, drawing the lines, pushing backward into the future. The labyrinthic lines I encounter at the gallery are in this piece of paper. A promise to the future, sharing the unshareable. Following Nancy Munoz writes, quote, the unshareable is that thing that is shared ours as the incalculable, the inoperative, the invaluable. He explains that we know these things as art, friendship, love, thought, knowledge, or more important for me, empathy. End quote. If language is some, car so, so, some sort of cartography, this interpretation is a way to translate Maravilla's works into a cartography. It is a process of, of finding the way to navigate together toward utopian environments. Maravilla offers us what I call co crossing geographies, multiple trajectory trajectories that are reenacted by utopian gestures and a provocation to find ourselves within this terrain so that we might recognize each other and perhaps by embodied repetition expand utopia. Tomorrow, I will play again with you, and in the meantime, our words vibrate. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really lovely and compelling. I'm so looking forward to revisiting um, what you've offered us uh, at the end with our question and answer session. And so folks can feel free to accumulate questions in the Q&A, um, those of you who are joining us on um, on Zoom, and then we'll turn to those at the very end of the panel. Um, and so next, we'll hear from Dr. Ivan Ramos, who um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Theater Arts and Performance Studies at Brown University. He was previously an assistant professor in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Maryland College Park, and a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Riverside. His broader research investigates the links and slippages between transnational Latino and Latino American aesthetics in relationship to the everydayness of contemporary and historical violence. In particular, he's interested in how the aesthetic may provide a way to engage within ethics of difference. His work brings together performance studies, queer and feminist theory, Latina, Latino, and Latinx American studies, and media and film studies. His first book, Sonic Negations, Unbelonging Subjects, Inauthentic Objects, and Sound Between Mexico and the United States, which is forthcoming from NYU Press, examines how, quote, dissonant sound brought together artists and alternative subcultures on both sides of the border in the wake of NAFTA to articulate a politics of negation against larger cultural and economic changes. He is also currently at work on a second book project tentatively, tentatively titled Death Without Mourning. And so now we'll hear from Dr. Ramos and his presentation, Where Shall We Bury Absent Bodies? Antigona Gonzalez, Poetic Abstraction and the Matter of Violence in Latina and Latino America. Uh, thank you, and hi everybody. Uh, this is my first time in person in <coughs> over two years, so it's quite lovely to sit in a panel with people. Um, so these are some first words as part of that second project that I'm trying to think of uh, for a chapter in both whatever will be some of the theoretical framework of the book, so I'll just start. Um, let's begin with the impossibility of the numbers. Ever since the inauguration of the contemporary drug war in Mexico, a battle waged among drug cartels, federal authorities, the military, and American forces, such as the DEA, some estimates place the number of deaths at about 5,000 a year. These numbers are often disputed, however, since we are often left unsure of whether bodies included in these, to in these numbers take into account the innumerable people disappeared um, whose bodies are never to be found. Um, some estimate um, 
leaving families and loved ones stuck in the cruel optimism of return. Some estimates place Mexico among the most dangerous places on earth, and in the last few years, it has earned the dubious distinction of being named the second most violent conflict zone in the world, second only to, to Syria, and ahead of other war-torn countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan. Mexican feminist theorist Sayak Valencia has called the proliferation of death and dead bodies capitalismo war. She writes, violence and spectacularization now cut across all fields of knowledge and action. It has become the preeminent model for the analysis of contemporary reality, as well as the fundamental driver of a global episteme that extends from the peripheries of the planet and vice versa, end quote. Valencia understands that the epidemic of violence across the Americas is not an exception, but rather the very condition of capital. She continues, quote, in gory capitalism, this process is redirected as the destruction of the body becomes in itself the product or commodity. The only kind of accumulation possible now is through a body count, as death has become more profitable business in existence, end quote. Renaming capitalism war, Valencia underscores the quotidian nature of violence is less than extraordinary what she calls capitalism's B-side. In the face of persistent and seemingly unending violence, however, global audience have reckoned with the sheer impossibility of counting the dead by turning to narratives that offer a way to humanize the disappeared. Although I have been thinking about these questions for years, in some ways the genesis of this project began in the aftermath of the kinds of public attention generated by the disappearance of 43 normalista students at Yosinapa in 2014. I don't want to minimize the weight of their extrajudicial killing, but ever since they became the exemplary victims of mass violence, I couldn't help but feel that this particular incident garnered such attention because it gave us a narrative. After all, we knew their names, their faces, their, pa their parents, their stories. They were representative because they were representable. But being from Tijuana, I knew that their cases were highly exceptional, and it's not that I didn't have endurance to them. I, both of my parents were normalistas in their youth. I was especially disheartened by the fact that the countless numbers of faithless and nameless victims who have been killed and disappeared all across Mexico over the past few decades could never possess such narrative value. Indeed, for violence to become unjust, we need to know that they had been, that they, that they have been worthy of mourning. I'm also a bit bothered by other discursive flights of hand regarding how we comprehend this kind of violence as a simple extension of colonialism as an explanation that ignores the mature realities of mass death or even the ongoing presence of American imperialism. Um, and that's a, that's a word that has more or less disappeared from a lot of the popular vocabulary of understanding the relations between both nations. We must also contend with the fact that the vast number of the nameless and the faceless have been women who have become victims of capitalism of war at multiple scales, not only in what we may recognize as narco violence, but also through the ways in which multinational factories or maquiladoras, which mostly rely on female workers, have facilitated a mass femicide throughout the country, what the late Sergio Gonzalez Rodriguez has referred to as the femicide machine. Or as Valencia and others have made clear, these deaths and disappearances have been characterized by their gruesomeness, a form of exhibition the dead in old, of exhibiting the dead in almost spectacular brutality, a viciousness that Jean Franco has termed cruel modernity. So how do we as viewers, witnesses, potential victims even, reckon with the mass scales of violence that have pervaded not just Mexico, but multiple sites across the Americas since colonialism, but becoming perfective of state violence to regimes to in places like Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, Brazil, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and other places? This project arises from the possibility of ever truly being able to comprehend these numbers that nonetheless groups away to a desire to narrate the stories of a few subjects we deem worthy of mourning. Indeed, as the disappearances of women began to mount, Ciudad Juarez became the geographic site that multiplies across attempts to narrate the lives of specific women who metonymically stood for all those whose stories could not get told. A number of documentaries, fiction films, and novels centered center certain stories and certain families in an attempt to make us enraged actors a representational gamble that failed to pay off. And even at some point, Jennifer Lopez starred in a <clears throat> film of a, as a detective going into Juarez to solve the problem. Uh, it's mostly been forgotten. Even in what is perhaps the most well-known rendering of the disappearances and deaths, Roberto Bolaño's 2666, it couches its clinical descriptions and names and causes of deaths in the narrative of a girl, of a central girl's disappearance we can be invested in. 
Jill Stoffer has suggested the notion of ethical loneliness to name, quote, the isolation one feels when one, as a violated person or as one member of a persecuted group, has been ab abandoned by humanity. It is a condition undergone by persons who have been unjustly treated and dehumanized by human beings and political structures, who emerge from that injustice only to find that the surrounding world will not listen or cannot properly hear their testimony, end quote. Stoffer chooses to bring these two words together since, quote, loneliness is so named because it is a form of social abandonment that can be imposed only by multiple ethical lapses on the part of human beings residing in the surrounding world, end quote. Ethical loneliness especially, is especially useful to grasp a condition of being abandoned, not only by those who commit such violence, but also, and perhaps especially, those just-minded people who would be expected to intervene within a liberal framework of human rights. Um, thus, the kinds of ongoing violence I have mentioned above rest on the fact that even through, and perhaps in part because of their narrativization, the need to name the disappear creates such a sense of ethical loneliness. Some names and some stories, only spoken out loud, seem exceptional even when they are meant to be exemplary. In speaking name or telling a story, countless others will remain unnamed and untold, in part because instead of allowing us to become overwhelmed by the reality of violence, we will be allowed to show empathy to those we have deemed worthy, innocent perhaps, or as I want to argue, those who possess a narrative that assure us that they had no complicity, that in the end they were worthy of being mourned. And so this paper and the larger project that this talk is drawn from comes from an attempt to find how several feminist and queer writers and artists have attempted to give shape to the dead without resorting to the need of making them knowable to us. Um, and so in this case, and I'm particularly interested in experimental work that abandons the narrative. I turn to a recent poetic text that has helped me make sense of this mass dose of violence by offering an aesthetics of loss and mourning captacious to include those whose narratives we will never know. Saro Uribe's Antigona Gonzalez is a poetic meditation on the ethical relation between those left alive and those who have disappeared or died. In the book, Uribe recasts herself as a version of Antigone in search of a corpse of her disappeared brother, Tadeo. Although Sophocles' Antigone provides the basis for the ostensible narrative, or what I would call its non-narrative, the text is preoccupied with the work of counting the dead when they have become uncountable of seeking justice when there is none to be found. The book begins with the following instructions. Quote, first the dates, like the names, are the most important, the name even more than the caliber of the bullets, end quote. Second, oh no, this is part of the thing, but sorry. Second, sit in front of a monitor, search out crime news from all the newspapers online, preserve the memory of those who have died. Third, count both innocent and guilty, killers, children, soldiers, civilians, majors, migrants, vendors, kidnappers, etc. Count them all. Need them all as to say this body could be mine, the body of one of my own, so as to not forget that all the bodies without names are our lost bodies. My name is Antigona Gonzalez, and I am searching among the dead for the corpse of my brother, end quote. This opening invocation sets up the stakes of the book. We must remember the names, but recognize that in doing so, we are faced with the nameless. The challenge is to recognize that these nameless are as, um, are as much ours as they are nobody or no bodies. The protagonist of this non-narrative is Antigona, who recognizes her become Antigone, as she exclaims at the beginning, I didn't want to be Antigone, but it happened to me, end quote. Although the book includes moments in which Antigona Gonzalez attempts to find her brother, she frequently explores the effective parameters of what disappearing means. She writes, quote, but no signs of any wild beast or any dog that had come and torn your body. Where you were before, now empty space. No one called to ask for a ransom or to threaten us. No one said a single word, as if they sought to erase you, erase you into even more silence." And quote. But this disappearance, this ripple in the very fabric of space becomes such a condition, as in the following page, Antigona tells us, quote, a woman attempts to tell the story of her younger brother's disappearance. This case wasn't on the news. It never merited a hearing. It's just another man who has left his house and headed to the border never to be seen again. Another man who bought a ticket and boarded a bus another man who waved goodbye to his children from the window, and then that image became the only thing a couple of kids will remember when they think about the last time they saw their father." End quote. However, Uribe significantly decides to leave absent the figure of Creon, the king who in the play refuses to let the protagonist bury her brother. And this is a significant choice. 
After all, the very impetus of the, pl of the play and what has made Antigone such a powerful figure is her defiance of Priam's law. And as Judith Butler reminds us in Antigone's claim, which is also a major influence on the Judas text, the figure of Antigone can function as a feminist protestation against the state itself. For there is no one figure that can stand for Creon, so it becomes dispersed instead on the bureaucracy that keeps Antigona from receiving any information about the whereabouts of her brother. Instead, we hear whispers, see files, and with them awful machinery that sustain the state's relationship to this violence. Tadeo, Antigona's brother, remains unstable throughout the narrative. Uribe provides us with a torrent of memories that are not her own. Tadeo takes the shape of many brothers and is dead. She exclaims, here we are all invisible. We have no face, we have no name. Here our presence seems suspended. Though the text would even interrupt Antigona's non-narrative with stories of bodies that have been found. And yet they remain nameless in the text. They are each Tadeo and we are all Antigone. Indeed, Uribe collapses the distinction between the living and the dead as she writes, quote, I'm also disappearing, Tadeo, and all of us here, if your body, if the bodies of our people, all of us here will gradually disappear. If no one searches for us, no one names us. All of us here will gradually disappear if we just look helplessly at each other, watching how we disappear one by one, end quote. With this, the dead and Antigone together become the chorus which cries for justice but remains ever far from it. Quote, and the, and the chorus in the book is done to italics. Um, I will always want to bury Tadeo, even if I am born a thousand times and he dies a thousand times, would you join me in taking out the body? End quote. This last call acts as a charge for the reader to come to terms with the fact that there can be no simple call to kinship or to ordinary relations. They can so easily claim the mantle of kinship. Uribe's claim is that in offering us the possibility of becoming Antigone, as well as Tadeus and the chorus, we might displace the distance that makes collective mourning and thus collective protestation impossible. It's not that she displaces the figure of the human, instead she extends it to those who might seem beyond the possibility of being counted within its boundaries. Throughout Antigona Gonzalez, Uribe includes short descriptions of other stagings of Antigone of the Americas. She connects the plight of the present with histories of violence that has spread throughout the corners of Latinidad, and that's the chapter is going to be seen if I can actually find records of some of these performances and seem to them together. I'm drawn to this text, perhaps because of the possibility that we may reconceptualize mourning without bodies and without the laws of kinship. As those who might still be living, we should not need a body and its narrative in order to feel its absence to know the pain of its disappearance. It's a form of existence that makes each loss particular and universal, a common thread as a condition for what remains of our aliveness. And so I will finish by turning what at first will appear an unlikely interlocutor to help me untangle the ethical offerings of the reader's writings, the French mystic and philosopher Simone Weil. For those who might be unfamiliar with Weil, I will offer a short biographical sketch. Born in 1909 to a secular Jewish French family, Weil was particularly, a particularly gifted student in philosophy, and she adopted, early adopted a sense of solidarity with the dispossessed from an early age. During her late adolescence, Bay experienced two encounters that made her deeply spiritual, including a vision in Assisi where she claimed to have encountered Jesus. But Bay would never come to be claimed by the Catholic Church, even though she called herself Catholic. And her acts of devotion were hardly committed to institutional practice. And she died at 34, refusing to eat more than was provided to soldiers in battle. The advice uh, writings provide the portrait of a woman deeply devoted to ethical practice and service of the other. In her later years, she became invested in developing a mode of the subjective position, or uh, that she referred to as creation, a complete abandonment of the subject position of the I in favor of becoming enmeshed in the suffering of the other. As Yun Tzu Cha writes, quote, Simone Weil does not tire of saying that the I must be emptied, renounced, reduced to the point it occupies in space and time, end quote. For Bay, this is the beginning of relationality and unmaking that allows the bunch of subjectivity to fall away in order to respond to suffering. And so I'll skip some parts that I have to do the creation and the possibility of attention. So I'll just finish with this paragraph. I turn to Bay to suggest two things. The first is that the ongoing violence in Mexico cannot be fully apprehended as violence because of the impasse of subjectivity that keeps us from apprehending the subjecthood of the other. At times, this is a racial impasse, and in the presentation of Latin American subjects attempting to cross the border, who only come to be apprehended somewhat as such when they're depicted as children. 
The cry, why am I being harmed, which means inaudible to us. The second argument I want to make is that a work like Antigona Gonzalez perhaps may function as a way for us to comprehend this cry beyond the constraints of the single body from which we expect to hear. Uribe works to create a chorus where the boundaries of the self hold the potentiality of becoming the other. This opens an ethical possibility not only of bridging this gap, but additionally to make a stranger of oneself, thus allowing us to see ourselves as a community of mourners, a bodily mass of strangers among each others, and perhaps also to ourselves. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Ramos. Uh, again, another super interesting and compelling presentation that we will revisit at the end in our Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions, please collect them um, in the Q&A feature. And so now we'll hear from Alexandria Miller, who is um, a PhD student in the Department of Africana Studies, and I'll also say again, a co-organizer of the conference. Um, I think it's an enormous feat to do both the presentation and the organization at a conference. Um, so Alexandria uh, earned a BA with distinction in African and African American Studies and History from Duke University. Before graduate school, Alexandria served as a college advisor with the Duke College Advising Corps and as a research associate at the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Quality. Her research interests include social movements, black feminism, Caribbean performance art and music, and Caribbean women's protests. Her current research explores the history of Jamaican reggae and contemporary music culture and activism. She's also the host of a bi-weekly podcast, which is excellent, uh, Strictly Facts, A Guide to Caribbean History and Culture. And so now Alexandra will talk to us about her presentation, A Note to Self, Mothering and Self-Mothering in Jamaican Reggae. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I think everything should be up now. Okay. Yes. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My presentation today is a bit preliminary as I'm working on my prospectus right now, but my presentation, A Note to Self, Mothering and Self-Mothering in Jamaican Reggae, um, draws inspiration primarily from two poetic writer-activists. First, the Jamaican reggae songstress Janine Janine Cunningham and her third album, A Note to Self, and Caribbean-American feminist scholar Audre Lorde, in her essay, Eye to Eye, Black Women Hatred and Anger, in which she writes, we, referring to black women, can learn to mother ourselves. It means that we must establish authority over our own definition. It means that I affirm my own worth by committing myself to my own survival, in my own self and in the self of other black women. It means that I learn my worth and genuine possibility. I refuse to settle for anything less than a rigorous pursuit of the possible in myself. For Janine, as one of the leading female reggae singers of today's generation, her discography in my exploration offers a necessary black Caribbean feminist lens to the historically male dominated genre. Note to self builds off the legacies of a relatively small number of successful women artists, legacies set forth by early singers like Rita Marley, Marcia Griffiths, and Judy Mowat, who all historicize what it means to be black, working class, oftentimes from a working class background, and especially mothers in the latter 20th century. Cunningham's latest project and the works of a growing number of contemporary female artists chart similar topics to the popular songs in the 1970s with one pertinent emphasis, and to quote from Janine, the work of self-development. It is through Lord's call to mother ourselves and Janine's call for self-development and emotional wellness that I have fashioned the title um, that you see in this paper as self-mothering. Women's issues have not been a particularly major subject in popular reggae music. In select times that women's issues are subjected, male reggae musicians have often extolled women's care work, their mothering, their ability to raise families under dire circumstances, for example, without regard for the weight on women's physical and emotional well-being, and potentially the constraints on their future hopes and dreams. This paper, or presentation rather, theorizes the challenges that women face, particularly um, through an analysis of how reggae both demonstrates and challenges this trope of the strong, resolute Caribbean mother. This work is driven by the need to address silences and absences of black womanhood, particularly in reggae's archive, as um, following a path set forth by scholars like Sadia Hartman, um, Mar Marissa J. Fuentes, and Jessica Marie Johnson, to name a few, 
do, that they do in their remedying of black women's silences in the archives, as well as the histori historiographic work of scholars of black women's music, um, like Angela Davis's Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, in which she writes, and I quote, recorded performances divulge unacknowledged traditions of feminist consciousness in working class black communities, end quote. I argue that by recovering these women's intellectual histories through song, we see that the slow but burgeoning numbers of black women artists call attention to care work and the need for self-mothering as an increasingly important theme in reggae. These female reggae singers articulate pragmatic definitions of self and are concerned with their own self-mothering to ensure their ultimate well-being in a gendered patriarchal system and genre that often leaves them marginalized, overworked, and under-resourced. Through depicting the intellectual properties of self-care and self-mothering, as demonstrated through songs and albums like John Nine's compilation, I write about self-mothering's potential to allow for black women's autonomous reclamation of their bodies and of themselves within the Caribbean's matrifocal structure. A structure that has been detailed by scholars like Edith Clark's 1957 study um, entitled My Father, My Mother Who Fathered Me Rather, described, um, in which she describes that black working class mothers care work, particularly their efforts to both, and I quote, bear the, in both the emotional and financial care and responsibility. These multi-layered aspects of care resting on the shoulders of one parent has not only feminized care work, but has also undervalued this work in society. Mothers who shoulder caring duties as well as the household's economic responsibilities are often caught in a web of poverty and structural inequity, particularly because care work has been seen as a fam familial necessity and not necessarily taken um, account as an unwaged labor. Scholars and activists like Ndaye, Fatima Z. Jackson, Karen Naido, Patricia Muhammad, and Althea Perkins have all researched and advocated for how Caribbean mothers' care work is undervalued and subsequently takes a toll on their own health. It is at the junctures of this realization that I write of self-mothering as black women's way of prioritizing themselves, ending cycles of self-sacrifice, and ensuring that they care for themselves as much, if not more, than they do for others. The recurring themes of self-mothering and self-care in women's reggae today helps to ensure that these cycles are broken. Um, the archive of reggae women's music is considerably, considerably smaller than their male counterparts. However, that does not mean black women have not always thought, sought, and found ways to care for themselves. There are a number of songs in the 70s and 80s um, that reference women's self-care, I think primarily um, through Jody Mawat's 1982 song, Only a Woman, in which she decries, why treat us um, inhuman just because we're women? In her 1987 song, Hush Baby Mother, from which she sings, Hush Baby Mo Mother, Things Will Get Better Tomorrow. I also read self-development in Songstress and Widow, Rita Marley's 2004 memoir, No Woman, No Cry, My Life with Bob Marley in which she describes moving out and away from her husband, buying her own home, and starting a garden. She describes this garden throughout the book as making her, and I quote, more content than she has been in so long and enabling her to cope in order to maintain her own mentality. Later in the, in the 70s when, her career take, when Bob Marley's career takes off, um, and she and the I3, including Jody Mowat and Marcy Griffiths, tour with his band, she, at numerous occasions, writes in her memoir that she missed the children and her garden, at one point even detailing phone calls, and I quote here, phone calls sort of take, took care of how she missed the children, but I missed my garden too. Although Marley does not openly refer to her, her garden as an act of self-mothering or self-care, her keen emphasis on just how instrumental her garden was to her overall well-being amongst her many roles as wife, mother, artist, and so forth, forth is integral to understanding how she found peace and solace amongst the chaos. As the only extensive memoir by a female reggae singer, I read this moment as vital to the very limited archive available that weaves the stories of reggae women's existences amongst and outside the patriarchal genre. A little, a little over um, 15 years later, self-mothering and self-care are becoming explicitly integral in reggae women's music. It is um, through her this recent album of John Nines and its accompanying documentary that she emphasizes the importance of self-care, self-awareness, and reflection. 
as with other as others have done before her Cunningham's dedication to the entire album um, in challenging the social order including patriarchy and what it means to be women are clearly noted um, the greatest challenge in my in her own words um, to the heteronormative heteronormative patriarchal structure is the track highly get to me in which she considers a potential suitor's affections her ultimate decision will be undetermined or will be determined by the inspiration she dri he drives um, there we go highly um flips the traditional romantic social order on its head because um her aim here is multi-layered challenging patriarchy hyper-masculinity and sexism, but most importantly, by establishing boundaries, boundaries um, of what is acceptable for herself romantically in the chorus in which she sings, he doesn't love highly, so his chances are slim, so I can't let him get to me. I theorize this as an act of foresight and self-mothering. She is clear about her potential suitor's shortcomings, and in order to do what is best for herself, her future, and potentially for the children they may share, she chooses to ignore his advances and prioritize herself instead. I mark Janine's album as pivotal in the reclaiming of one's own healing, not just through song, but also through the follow-up of her album, um, which she called the NTS Challenge or the Note to Self Challenge, a public six-week series of self-exploration featuring the artist herself that was based on the tenets of self-study self-love and self-governance. In posts on her website and social media, Cunningham describes the NTS challenge as an opportunity to actually clear the way for your own spiritual, mental, and physical evolution. Such a focus on self-mothering can also be seen and heard throughout a number of other artists um, that I'm now looking at in my own research, um, thinking through Lila Ike and Jazalise primarily, Ike's May 2020 debut album, The Experience, um, includes self-care song, Solitude, from which she sings, Peace of Mind, that is what I just seek to find. I ain't in the mood, I just need some solitude. Solitude is about Ike's need to escape from the world and carve out time for herself and recharge. The song continues that, the, that to find peace of mind, she must put her phone on airplane mode, block people out, and disappear to the habitat, and that's a quote, um, the recording studio she often records at. The visuals in the music video, like the one here, um, show, her do, show her doing just that, escaping to the mountains, writing, playing guitar, or practicing yoga. As made clear from just a few of these songs I've mentioned here, self-care and self-mothering are becoming not only integral, theme, uh, integral themes in contemporary women's reggae, but can also be read as an intentional revolutionary act to reconnect with oneself amidst the challenges brought on by their intersectional identities. Self-mothering then is a direct result of their awareness of black women's challenges and represents their solution to circumvent these trials and better themselves. Whereas black women have been historically labeled and devalued as caretakers, this challenge, or this changing narrative, sorry, um, seeks to create new possibilities and awareness for self-care. By no means is self-mothering a new concept. Audre Lorde, Rita Marley, Judy Moatz, Janine, and Lila Ike all discuss the importance of self-mothering and self-care in their writing and discographies. Even so, the prevalence of black women's ingenuity and thirst for balance and stability is a rather new theme within reggae music today. Reggae's ability to rally its listeners for black freedom was key to its growth in the 1970s, but this rallying addresses freedom through concerns for mental health, emotional wellness, and women's rights. Self-mothering continues to become a major theme for black female reggae artists who, who choose to satisfy their own needs first and then be in service to others. It is my hope as more women in, their, in reggae continue to make their mark that the genre's meaning, influence, and ability to evoke change will truly transform possibilities for growth for all. And I will close with hopefully playing a brief snippet, snippet of the title track, um, Note to Self. Let's go. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexandria. Um, I'm so glad that we can have a conversation that really crosses the region, which I think is one of the great things that this conference is highlighting today. Um, and so now we're going to uh, kind of go back to the border region that we were talking about before um, with uh, Tanya Guinega, who is joining us on Zoom. Um, and Tanya is a Los Angeles-based artist, designer, craftsperson who was raised in Tijuana, Mexico. She holds an MFA in furniture design from Rhode Island School of Design, right, our neighbors right here, um, and a BA from San Diego State University. In her formative years, she created various collaborative installations with the Border Arts Workshop, an artist group that engages the languages of activism and community-based public art. Her current work uses craft as a performative medium to generate dialogues about identity, culture, and gender while creating community. This approach has helped museums and nonprofits in the United States and Mexico diversify their audiences by connecting marginalized communities through collaboration. And so now we'll hear from, from Tanya with her, her presentation, Craft at the Border. Um, yeah, so my name is Tania Guiniga, um, and I grew up in San Diego and Tijuana, so um, I know that you guys are far away from, I'm in LA right now, um, so here's a little map of, for those of you that don't know where Tijuana is, it's right next to San Diego, um, but on the Mexican side, so I actually grew up a few blocks away from the border fence, um, and so here's a picture of what the border fence looked like for a lot of my life. Um, and so the Mexican side is on the left and the US side is the unstepped on part. Um, and so a lot of my work has to do um, with border emotion. And so um, what I like to, to talk to people about, you know, when looking at this image is um, just how much trauma and psychological effects we deal with because of living next to the border. Um, and so here's a quote um, from a book called Wall Disease, the psychological toll of living up against a, a border. And so it says, what we are seeing is just the monster's tail. And there is something terrifying about seeing the tail of a beast whose full contours and capacity and disposition we do not yet know. Um, and so I grew up crossing the border every single day to go to school in San Diego, um, which meant leaving 3.30 in the morning to be at school at eight in the morning. Um, and I did this from age um, four to 18. And so I'm actually one of, this is a very old graphic but it shows um, the large amount of transnational um, border crossers that there are that live on the Mexican side, but um, go to school or go to work on the US side. And so um, unbeknownst to me um, as a child, um, 
the border had already been used as a place for dialogue about, um, you know, using art as a tool to talk about different issues that our, our communities face. And so the border art workshop um, had started in 1984 and was doing lots of different um, performance pieces. This is at the border right by my house before they built the fence. So we used to have, we used to be able to go back and forth. Um, and so just a few slides just showing um, work that I grew up with. Um, so this is a, a image, very old image um, from the first performance that um, the Border Art Workshop did. And then this is a piece that I grew up with. Um, this is in 1997. This is Marco Ramirez Erres Trojan horse, which is a, a double-headed Trojan horse that straddles the actual border crossing, um, the actual physical line. Um, and so I would see this every day. Um, and this was part of a biennial that used to happen in Tijuana and San Diego called um, Insight. And so in the 90s, I actually got brought in. I met um, one of the founding members of the Border Art Workshop when I was in community college. And so I actually became part of the Border Art Workshop in 1997. And so a lot of the work that I did in the beginning of um, studying art and getting to know what art can do was a lot of work that had to do um, with Operation Gatekeeper and using art um, to bring attention to what was happening at our border, which was the increased deaths of migrants as they were being forced to cross through the desert. And so a lot of the works that we did um, in these, these beginning years um, with the Border Art Workshop was working with different um, organizations that supported migrant rights. Some of them were faith-based. Um, and what we did was to, again, this was all around Operation Gatekeeper. So a lot of it was working with bringing people's attention to what was happening. And this is an installation that we did in the Zocalo in Mexico City. Um, and so the image is of the image we used to have in Southern California of a family running across the border. But what we would do is we would work with the coroner's office to get information about um, migrants that had been found um, um, dead um, at the, the desert. And so if there was any information known about their ages, their names, where they had come from, their genders. And so for years, we did lots of different installations all over the, the US-Mexico border. Um, and a lot of them coincided with times when different dignitaries were flying into Tijuana. So we would place these installations in front of the, the airport so that they would be forced to, to see these images and contend with the fact that a humanitarian crisis was happening and nobody was doing anything about it. And so in 2016, um, I started this project called Ambos, Art Made Between Opposite Sides. And this project I started during the first time Trump was running, um, after he started saying that, um, that Mexicans were, were all rapists and bad people. Um, and so I really, you know, had spent a lot of time studying craft and working all over um, all over the U.S. and Mexico, working with different craft-based communities and marginalized communities. And so I really wanted to, to check back in with my community. And in the beginning, I, I was thinking just of focusing on the San Ysidro border crossing, which is the one that I crossed every day um, as a place where we could really, like, take a deep dive into thinking about our transition, um, into the U.S. daily as transnational people, um, thinking about just asking people how they felt and giving um, my community a platform to also see our connection to one another. And so one of the main projects for this first phase of, of the Ambos project was the border kipu. And so it was based on a kipu, which here's a picture of a kipu, which is a, um, an Andean organizational system. It's, it's Incan. And so using the kipu, what I did was I created these postcards um, that we handed people at the border. Um, and it said, what are your thoughts when you cross this border? And originally it was focused just on transnational folks. Um, and then later we changed it to also include people that had been deported, people that do not wish to cross the border, people that cannot cross the border, and those that make a living at the border. And so we asked people to write their thoughts, but then we also asked them to make a knot. So the postcard would say, these two strings represent the relationship between US and Mexico, ourselves at either side of the border and or our mental state while crossing. And then it asked people to make a symbolic knot. 
And so these were handed um, to people that were waiting in line, to people that were vendors, to people that just congregated at the border. And then the individual knots um, were tied together each day so that people could visualize their connection to one another um, because our community is very stigmatized, those of us that, that cross back and forth. Um, and so we ended up doing this, um, it took us three years as AMBOS project, um, but we ended up doing this project at every US-Mexico border port of entry. Um, and we carried out the border people on the Mexican side. And so in the first massive round that we did, the big leg of the US-Mexico border, we noticed um, that there was a pattern emerging of different, of different um, emotions that were coming up in people's writing. So in San Diego and Tijuana, it was anger and Nogales and Nogales, oops, Nogales and Nogales was fear. Douglas and Aguaprita was gratitude and El Paso and Ciudad Juarez was violence. Um, and so when we saw this different kind of, you know, standout thing of gratitude, we knew that we needed to continue um, the border people and finish the entirety of the US-Mexico border to understand our relationships um, across borders, but also across the entirety of the of the, the region. And so it took us three years, but um, here's a map of all the cities that we went to. And some of the writing is, what are your thoughts when you cross this border? A place of contradictions, a place of weight, a place where people become hysterical, a sad place, a non-place. And we ended up amassing over 7,000 responses and engaged over 10,000 people. Here's one from Juarez. Um, the El Paso Juarez border plex is a place in radiant negotiation with itself. Each day we wake up as one, our home of three states, two countries, and one heart. And so with, um, with the, the AMBOS project, we also did different performances along the entirety of the US-Mexico border, sometimes in collaboration with other artists from the border and sometimes in collaboration with each other. Um, so this is a sound piece that we did where we um, collaborated with Glenn Wyant, who was a sound artist, and we hit the border wall once each time for each person that had, that had perished in that section of the, of the border. Here's another one um, where my collaborator and friend um, Jackie Amesquita and I um, did backstrap weaving attached to each other through the border fence um, in Douglas and Agua Prieta. And then this is one on the old border fence wall, which that part of the, the wall is a corrugated fence. Um, and that fence was actually landing mats that were used first in the Vietnam War and then second um, in the Gulf War um, for the US military to land jets. Um, and so on the opposite side of the, of the wall, you see Trump's prototype walls, which have since been completely demolished, removed, and there's no trace of them. And so in that piece, we did um, a rubbing a rust print on the fence um, so that we could have a piece that could travel to show people what the fence looks like. And then this is a more recent uh, performance that I did. And all of these you can either find on my website or on the AMBOS website. Um, but this is a piece where I wore a glass suit and did a two hour performance in front of the Border Patrol headquarters in San Diego, um, walking until the, the glass um, broke and fell apart. So the glass guaraches started to break um, and the performance was walking back and forth. And so a lot of the work that I do, um, if it's not um, object-based, a lot of it is also focused on helping our communities at the border. Um, and so this is an image of a exhibition that I did in um, Mesa, Arizona. And so this was encouraging people to make mutual aid packs um, and talking to them about the death in their region so that they would be more aware of what's happening. And so here's a map of the recorded um, bodies that have been, or deaths that have been accounted for. And again, this is just recorded. And the map is the US-Mexico border and the region that has the heavy red area is the region where the exhibition was, which is in the Sonoran Desert. Um, and so part of it has also been to try to help people understand how easy it is to get informed, how easy it is to get involved. And so making it easy for them to be able to educate themselves on history of our region, but also ways to get directly involved. 
in supporting um, migrant right organizations. And also for people to, to talk about, you know, family separation with their families, um, dealing with grief and loss, um, knowing their rights if they are themselves immigrants. And again, um, teach, just making it easy for people to, to help. And so one of the main projects um, that I'm doing right now as Ambos Project is I founded um, Ceramic Studio at an LGBTQ asylum shelter in Tijuana. And so one of the main projects that we did, um, this was installed in December of this last year, was a project with copaleros, with incense burners. And we don't have any places um, for people to pray. We don't have any places to memorialize our dead. We don't have any places to, um, to really address um, the hardships that, that our migrant communities face trying to cross or the separation. And so the students at the asylum shelter um, participated in helping me make these copaleros. And then um, Ambos Project um, collaborators and I traveled across the entirety of the border um, to install these copaleros in different sites um, along the border. And so here's some images for you of um, the different sites that, that we installed them at. Um, and the different sites, in some places, there's still no fence. So the majority of the, the Rio Grande area um, still has no fence. And so in some places, um, the copaleros were to help people and to guide them, but also to, to give people um, survival like necessities and in other places. Um, so this image is an image of on the other side um, of the, the, the Rio Grande, you can see there's a false wall that the US made with containers. Um, and then they have um, Humvees and um, they had military actually there um, pointing the guns over at the, the Mexican side just because of the caravans. And this is a site where right a week before we got there, um, they had deported 15,000 Haitian migrants. Um, but yeah, so just different images and I'm sure we can talk about all this stuff. Um, and so here's another image of another copalero and this is on the Mexican side and on the US side you can see um, the Levi's outlet and Adidas outlet and all of that, which is um, a common site on our US-Mexico border. Um, but yeah, I'll keep going because I don't want to take up all the time that I have. This is another copalero. Um, this is in Los Ebanos, which has a ferry that's hand pulled that crosses people from one side to the other. Um, and then this is in Matamoros at the end of where, where the border actually meets the Gulf. Um, but yeah, so here's ambosproject.com and then my, um, so if you guys want to see any of the actual images or videos, um, then you can, let's see, stop share. Yeah. Okay. All right. I did it in time. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much, Tanya, for, for sharing your art with us and to all of our panelists. Um, I'm really excited, like I said, to be able to talk about art and performance across the region and, and to be able to think across different kinds of people who are resisting in different kinds of ways. Um, it was a, really my pleasure to be able to sit with you all here and with Tanya online um, and to engage with these ways that we, we think about and fill absence um, with, with art, with creativity, with uh, the cartographies that, uh, that Amanda was talking about, with performance from Ibang, with music uh, from, from Alexandria, and with the, these textiles and the copaleros and those things that Tanya shared with us. So we had this kind of wide range of different artistic practices, but I think you all are asking us to think about the different kinds of ways um, that we feel that we feel absence and we try to tell stories in new and fresh ways. Um, so I would love to invite questions from the audience um, for folks that are in the Zoom. You're welcome to use the Q&A feature. Um, the folks who are panelists are also welcome to um, pop your cameras on and we can hear from you live. Um, and of course, folks in the room are, uh, and the panelists themselves are welcome to, to question. Oh, and on YouTube, um, Alexandria is uh, checking out the, the comments on YouTube. So if you're uh, watching on the live stream, feel free to comment as well. 
Um, would would y'all, does anyone on the panel want to have a word before I jump in? I don't know. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know where to start because I was so excited about everything that you all shared. Um, but I will, I'll start with a question for, um, for Amanda because I'm also super excited about the kinds of ideas that we get from thinking about vibration and touch in the body. And I was wondering if you, at the end, you started to elaborate about how those things are talking about call and response and the, the ways that you are seeing kind of the body in this constellation. And I was wondering if you might um, revisit that and tell us a little bit more about the ways that you're thinking about sound, vibration, touch, and the body. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I started working with the, like, first focusing on the Tripachuca game, but now I'm thinking about the ritual that Maravilla does with the gongs in the headdresses. Mm -hmm. So it's like a healing practice mm -hmm. that moves, like, actually pushes the idea of, like, a again, gen, gen, like uh, the creation of uh, affective communities, healing through sound, and the sound that it's something that it's also, for me, kind of timeless and out of time. So it has the pot potentiality to break those kind of, uh, I would say, artificial boundaries and limits uh, between the past and the present. And it's also, uh, in a way, that uh, it's not bounded to space, so it is, it is, it is expansive. And it allows to touch each other without like the physical contact. So it's like uh, something that is beyond the material touch. Mm -hmm. So I believe that in a part that that's something like super important that I, I'm looking into like uh, at Maravilla's work and how this practice of like sounding each other like and sa sounding a space uh, has become like really effective as a healing practice for communities all over where he presents his work. And workshops has been like uh, rep reproduced by multiple people because he teaches them how to redo these practices. So because they, again, it's a call and response and who, whoever like assist or like as is present in these things uh, can reproduce it and you know generate like a cycle of healing and belonging otherwise. That's so interesting. I wonder if maybe Tanya has something to add to that, especially with, I was thinking about um, the 96 deaths and the way the vibration and sound are, are really kind of in that same area. So I wonder if you might have some, some thoughts. One second, Tanya, we have a little technical issue, sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can't turn on, yeah, well I can't turn on my audio because the mic's still on, but the audio here is not working. It's going to do the same reverberation. Huh. Tanya, can you try again? You just turn it up. Can you choose one after the other? It's also stopping streaming on YouTube, too. It's just black. Well, it's not stopped, but the stream is black. So I don't know if that has anything to Sorry, do with it. Sorry, y'all. Hang in there. <laughs> Can Sam turn off our mics and we'll just use our computers?
whose presentation title is Migration, Maras and Mayhem, Microhistories of Exclusion and Violence by MS-13 Hitmen in El Salvador. Esteban Luceno is professor of Spanish at Assumption University. His publications and research focus on contemporary Latin American and Latinx film, narratives, music, and art, as these intersect with issues related to migration, dispossession, and human rights. Combining teaching with civic engagement, he has developed various workshops and cultural programs with Mexican immigrant communities in the Midwest and Central American region. Uh, and, in, and in Central America on unaccompanied refugee minors in New England. He's co-editor of the book, Telling Migrant Stories, Latin American Diaspora in Documentary Film, 2018. Esteban, over to you on your title, Migration, Maras and Mayhem, Microhistories of Exclusion and Violence by MS-13 Hitmen in El Salvador. Thank you, Brian. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, as we gather to explore the nexus between migration and violence and historical and contemporary migration across the Americas, and also as we consider the limits of various states in the region to respond and to handle these violent forms of displacement, I wonder about the root of such limitations and about the effects that the state action and inaction has on the most vulnerable. How does the state respond to its own limitations? To what extent people find their lives limited by the actions of the state? And what limited choices do poor people have in the midst of all of this? Coming from the fields of Latin American literary and cultural studies, I approach these questions from cross-cultural dialogues that question the centrality of liberal democracy as a philosophical framework through which to resolve the political and social problems affecting the region. In countries like Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, multiple manifestations of violence, often at extreme levels, cause mayhem in the public sphere, limiting governability. Perhaps the main challenge to governability in these societies is the fact that much of the violence is either caused or sanctioned by the state. Therefore, liberal democracy and the rule of law offer limited solutions to the problem of contemporary violence in the region. In her book, Liberalism at Its Limits, Crime and Terror in the Latin American Cultural Text, Ileana Rodriguez argues that under such violent scenarios, most public debates on crime and terrorism turn into confrontations between vernacular forms of social behavior and liberalism as universality is contested by local ideas. With the devaluation of moral values and the future of democracy at stake in most of Latin America and the Caribbean, Rodriguez turns to women and ethnic groups to disrupt the material and discursive tension that lead to violence. She claims that women and ethnic groups are agents of both material and discursive disruptions. They're both social actors and figures and tropes in discourse. They have sufficiently documented this fact in testimonial literature, as well as in the wealth of legal depositions filed in court records and in anthropological and sociological research. To register the voices of those who tend to be denied access to the master narratives that frame the nation state, testimonial literature requires an epistemo epistemological inversion that rejects the bias that keeps the poor and the marginalized from being recognized as conscious subjects of their own history. To begin to answer then the questions I posted earlier on the root of violence in Central America, the role of the state that the state plays in the production of violence and the choices poor people have in the midst of all of this, I turn to Oscar Martinez and Juan Jose Martinez microhistory the Hollywood Kid, The Violent Life and the Violent Death of an MS-13 Hitman. The Martinez brothers, the former a journalist for El Faro.net and the, later, the latter an anthropologist and ethnographer have dedicated their professional lives to understanding violence in Central America from the perspectives of those who have often forgotten by the state and the ruling classes. Writing against the grain of history written by the victors, 
The Martinez brothers collect stories by the subaltern to uncover their agency as historical actors. As John Lee Anderson has noted, their sources tend to be window washers, prostitutes, migrants, deportees, killers, sicarios, good and bad cops, judges, and prosecutors. In The Hollywood Kid, their first co-author book, they unmask the real impact that the United States and El Salvador have had in the history of migration and violence. In the process, the authors redraw a geopolitical map linking the United States, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador into a single region ruled by capital, crime, and coercion. By engaging with these cultural texts, the reader comes to understand just how difficult it has been for poor Salvadorian young boys to resist not being pulled into a life of violence when society, the state, guerrillas, and gangs don't offer them many other alternatives. Hopeless young boys join a gang for self-protection and respect, not knowing the high price they're being forced to pay. But what draws Tovar, one of the main characters, and other sicarios to tell their stories of crime and betrayal is something greater than respect. It is their desire to be recognized as full, as full human beings, rational men, fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, fugitives, and citizens, people becoming subjects of history through the relationship and trust they form with the interviewers. In what follows, I will briefly comment on these elements that give meaning to a shared hemispheric history of migration and violence as seen through the lens of microhistory. One characteristic of microhistories is the effort to build a social network that traces together different social actors, distant places, and disconnected events. This strategy is necessary when trying to get to the root of violence in Central America. In the context of El Salvador, rather than placing all the blame for today's violence on the barbaric ruthlessness of the Mara Salvatrucha and the Barrio 18, as the state and most mainstream media outlets do, the Martinez brothers turn the official discourse upside down and argue that today's gang violence has its roots in the origins of the Salvadorian National Guard and the Cold War policies of the Ronald Reagan administration. Created in 19, uh, 1912, the Salvadorian National Guard was formed to pull together the various state uh, police offices, uh, forces, including the National Police and the Plantation Police. These units became a symbol of unchecked power across El Salvador. Combined, they served their interests of the land-owning oligarchy and established a state of terror marked by La Matanza in 1932, the invasion of Honduras led by General Jose Alberto Chele Medrano in 1969, the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero in 19, 1980, orchestrated by Roberto da Buzon, the civil war between the state armed forces and the FMLN, and finally, the use of Salvadorian territory as a drug trafficking corridor today. Oscar and Juan Jose Martinez continue to trace the combined traumatic effects of violence and migration by listening to the voices and testimonies by former gang members. During the Civil War, the US military invested $1 million a day by importing large amounts of weapons and training five new elite battalions. This led to a tremendous show of force by the National Guard and an equal response by the FMLN, each side responding on the recruitment of poor peasants as fighters. According to the Martinez brothers, in a country whose population was 60% children, the results were inevitable. Thousands of kids younger than 15 were recruited to both sides of the conflict. They trained as killing machines. Many soldiers on both camps died or deserted to the United States. Fleeing El Salvador by the thousands, most young ex-combatants and their families settled in Spanish-speaking neighborhoods in LA. They came to California seeking refuge after fleeing the war. But by being left to fend for themselves in the US, by the US government in barrios and neighborhoods controlled by the Chicano, Black, Asian American, and white supremacist gangs, that gave the newly arrived Salvadorians a continued sense of being abandoned and betrayed once again by the state. An anonymous war veteran who battled the guerrilla fighters in the mountains of El Salvador and a former Barrio 18 gang member who fled for California in the 1980s tells the Martinez brothers, we fled the war, we didn't want more war, 
But over there, we found another bunch of problems. As they arrived in LA, most of the Salvadorian youth had a difficult time adjusting to school and daily life. They were placed in underfunded special education programs and fell prey to gangsters controlling the streets. Their one escape became heavy metal music, ACDC, Slayer, Black Sabbath, heavy, hard music that though the Salvadorians couldn't always understand the lyrics, they understood the euphoria smoking off the well-tuned basses. Coming together through heavy metal and Satanism, Salvadorian kids started referring to themselves as stoners. To set themselves apart in the city, they landed on a new name, La Mara Salvatrucha Stoner, or MSS, a small cluster of autonomous cells that rarely interacted and wasn't a, that wasn't that organ, organized. Soon gang members got into trouble with the police and were thrown in jail. In prison, all the Latino gangs, despite their street rivalries, came together in a coalition known as the Mexican Mafia. Each clique adopted their name depending on the street or, neighbor, or neighborhood where they came from. And since the M is a 13th letter in the alphabet, gangs loyal to the Mexican Mafia adopted the number 13 in their names as a sign of loyalty and respect. In prison is where the MS-13 members gave up their heavy metal attire and adopted a cholo dress code as the Mexican mafia. In the Hollywood kit, Richard belonged to the urban commando guerrillas unit during the civil war, but later migrated to LA in the early eighties, scared of, of the five battalions created by the Reagan administration. Coming on Rich, commenting on Richard's life, the authors write, where he came from, what you did when you saw an enemy was simple. You aimed your weapon and fired. But it was different in the Sureño neighborhood of LA. Each black, each block and hood was dominated by a particular Latino gang, typically named after, after the barrio. Richard and the many other forgotten kids who joined a gang tried to forge meaning in their life. They found in the hatred of the other and in the conflict with the other. As the Martinez brothers learned, it was the only way of life they knew. And to conclude, and we can continue this in the conversation. I just want to finish by saying that the micro histories collected in the Hollywood Kid include otherwise unheard and silenced voices that point to the policies of the United States and El Salvador as the root of the problem of migration and of violence in the region. One of these voices is that of the Hollywood Kid himself, a gangster who joined an MS-13 clique in his village of San Lorenzo and became one of its fearless killers. He belonged to and was later betrayed by a clique named after a foreign and distant place he never learned to pronounce correctly. I would like to close my talk with a phrase that Miguel Angel Tobar mentions in his book and that seems to sum up not only his life but the life of so many other children of the war in El Salvador. They didn't give me no other choice. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban, uh, and well within my, my time. Um, I want to move on now to uh, our next presenter, who is Samuel Loronia from the University of Sonora. Samuel Loronia is a historian and an independent researcher in the fields of immigration policy and immigrants through history. He received his BA in history from the University of Sonora in Mexico. Currently, he's the director of the historical archives of Tubatuma and Atil, two small municipalities in Mexico. In the archives field, his interest is in rescuing the documental history of, the, of these municipalities in the north of Sonora. Samuel's presentation is titled International Smuggling Networks in Altar, Sonora, the Case of Security Houses for Central American Immigrants in 20. 21. Samuel, over to you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me clear? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon to everyone. And I want, I want to thank you to the CLAX committee and my co-panelists for being here sharing uh, their, their papers. I'm gonna share my screen because they made a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Just give me a minute. And wait. Okay, do you see my presentation? 
Wait. <laughs> One moment. Just a little bit of noise. Well, it's okay. Uh, great. Uh, well, if the title of my presentation, as Brian said, is International Smuggling Networks in Altar Sonora, the case of security houses for Central American immigrants in 2021. Uh, in this presentation, well, this presentation is the is the result of uh, research that I made the last summer in the municipality of Altar Sonora. Uh, I made uh, some, well, several uh, interviews to Central American immigrants in Altar. Uh, they they were from different countries in South America. We are talking about Nicaragua, El Salvador, eh, Guatemala, y Honduras, and Honduras. Eh, I made around 20, 25 interviews and about, about these cases. And how, uh, how these persons were in Altar instead another cross points in Mexico as Tijuana or Nogales. Uh, this work is, is an approach to the, um, to the Central American immigrants uh, that choose to cross uh, the border or to cross the border by uh, smugglers in Altar. Wait a minute. Well, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the space and where was this? Uh, this where where was made this research? And it's about uh, Altar Sonora. It's a small municipality in the north of the state of Sonora uh, that is that has border with the state of Arizona, with the south of the state of Arizona. Uh, let me do the next. Okay. Okay. You can see, as you can see in the in the top of the image, I have I have the map in, in Spanish. I, I didn't found an, one in uh, in English. But in the top of the of the picture or the map, uh, you can see the part of the portion of the of the Mexico US border. Uh, so what do we have here? We have a municipality with a portion of the border, and we have uh, we have an immigrant flows, well, an immigrant flow in in Altar. So that's why uh, we have immigrants in a small municipality in 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 Mexico. So then we have the. We have the, the role of the local cartels and the smugglers, because the smugglers uh, do an arrangement to the local cartels to, to uh, allow to the immigrants to cross, to cross that portion of the border. Wait. Wait a minute. OK. Uh, Brother, okay. Here we have a map with uh, the border between the state, the Mexican state of Sonora, and Arizona. We have six uh, ports of entry. The major ones we are talking about: San Luis Rio Colorado, Nogales, Agua Prieta, and Sonoita. And they have their own cities by the American side. We are talking about San Luis, Lookville. Uh, Nogales and Douglas. So we have two minor ports of entry. We are in, we are talking about Sasabe and Naco. Uh, the portion of the border of uh, Altar municipality is Sasabe. So the local mafia control the Mexican side of, of that border. So 
if someone, anyone, uh, want to cross illegally by that border, uh, have to pay to the to the to the local to a local mafia. So they have to pay an amount to allow them to cross uh, to the U.S. because they have no wall in there, so they have that advantage if we want to call it that way. Wait. So that's the, that's the particularity of this, of this uh, municipality and this port of entry. Next one, we are, now this is the immigrant codes and the smuggling networks. I have made, uh, as I said um, at the beginning of, of this presentation, uh, some uh, interviews to Central American immigrants. And every one of them uh, told me when they, uh, when they bought the service of a smuggler to, pro to go to the US, they gave them a code. So that code allows them to cross their, their, um, their country, uh, wherever we're, we're talking about, uh, in the case of Guatemala or Salvador, and to cross all Mexico through blind, sp through blind spots where uh, the army or the National Immigration Institute can, can deport them. So that's how it works, uh, the networks. They have a smuggler in, in, their, in their country. After that, they exchange the code to a Mexican smuggler and they, they, uh, they take them to the border. And in this case, we are talking about Altar. Okay, we are, we are seeing the exchange codes by the smugglers, uh, the, difference, the differences in, in immigrant treatment in both countries. When they depart from the, the country, uh, they are in hotels, they, they are in, in a bus, but when they cross to Mexico, the, the way uh, to altar, it's uh, it's in a it's in an immigrant storage. They say they call them that way, the storage. In in Spanish, uh, we have the word bodega, but if we translate that word to the English, we have a storage. Why? Uh, security houses or storage? Uh, they say storage because it's more easy for the smugglers to keep them hide from the Mexican authorities. And that way, the Mexican authorities don't uh, deport them. So that, that's the reason of the storage of the or, or of the security houses. We have uh, the, the word security with a new meaning because uh, for the immigrants, uh, the storage or, or the security houses represents that they are not going to be the port to their countries. They will, will keep the opportunity to cross to the US, to, cro to cross to El Otro Lado, or if we translate that word, to uh, the other side uh, by a smaller. Well, let me, well, the weight and the experience of alternative roads. Because all these immigrants don't go by, the, by a freeway in Mexico. They don't. They go by blind spots and storage by storage uh, until they arrive to the, until they arrive to the, to the storage the last storage after, uh, no, before 
they cross to the US. Uh, well, we have we have three different three different countries: El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And all of them told me in their interviews it was a very hard it was a very hard um, journey uh, to altar because uh, the, the, it was uh, it was hard. They had no hotel. They had no. They had no food. They were in a truck. Uh, inhuman, uh, probably. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna conclude uh, my presentation, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, Samuel, um, very much. I was just sending you a note, but you came in on the button. Um, thank you for your presentation, and we'll come back to questions, hopefully, because there's a lot to, to be unpacked there in the, the question and answer period to come. Uh, our next presenter is Natalie Dietrich Jones from the University of the West Indies. Nat Natalie Dietrich Jones is a research fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, Salises, at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. At Salises, she coordinates the course Small States Development, Challenges and Opportunities. Her research interests include geographies of the border, managed migration, and intra-regional migration in the Caribbean. Dr. Dietrich Jones is chair of the Migration and Development Cluster, an interdisciplinary group of researchers exploring contemporary issues concerning migration in the Caribbean and its diaspora. She's also a research associate with the Institute of Island Studies, University of Prince Edward Island. Natalie's presentation is titled, The Tension as Violence, the State Response to the Venezuelan Migration Crisis in the Dutch Caribbean. Natalie, over to you. Afternoon, everyone. Um, just checking that you're hearing and seeing this. Um, okay, good. So thanks to the Clax team for the opportunity to present on a sub-regional space that is not often included in border discourse. Um, I will qualify that in a bit. Um, my presentation is divided into two parts. Um, first, I will discuss the context for violence, and then I will describe the acts of violence, which include detention, as is indicated in the title of the presentation. So I just wanted to locate myself a little bit on this paper, um, this presentation, which has evolved from this blog that came out in 2021 on the Border Criminologies blog that's based at the University of Oxford and um, comes from field research that I've been undertaking since 2018 in, a, well, first in Curacao and then in Aruba and Curacao as well as Trinidad and Tobago. I, um, I have been examining the experience of Southern Caribbean states with the management of the Venezuelan migration crisis. And obviously I had plans to travel to back to the Dutch Caribbean and then COVID interrupted those plans. So a lot of this research is based on um, content and discourse analysis of institutional reports, as well as local, local being mm -hmm. Um, the Dutch Caribbean regional and international newspapers. And uh, for those who may not have an idea of the exact location of the Dutch Caribbean, I've put this map here um, for a number of reasons. One is to show just how close these islands are to the coast of Venezuela. It's 40 
kilometers and 24 kilometers respectively for Curacao and Aruba. And there was a point when Curacao was administered um, by Venezuela. They have a very long history that in, involves mobility of people and mobility of goods. And in both Aruba and Curacao, the population of Venezuelans is just shy of 20%. So it's over centuries of migration between these two spaces, um, which um, makes the current situation even more concerning because on both sides of the ocean, there are persons with family members living in each um, space. This part is going to be very, <laughs> I'll try to be as brief as possible. It's a little bit complicated, but um, by and large, the history of violence in the, in the Dutch Caribbean in a way continues today because both countries, um, while being autonomous countries within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, um, still have their governance and administration managed by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So the Kingdom of the Netherlands is not one country, it's actually four, three of which are in the, the Dutch Caribbean. And on the left, you will see the time, the time chart, which shows the different political movements um, in Aruba. So um, Aruba became autonomous in 1986 and Curacao in 2010. This part is important because we're talking about the state and the state is seen as this, I guess, a unitary actor um, that is based in one jurisdiction. But what we're seeing in the case of the, the, the Dutch Caribbean is that the state actually transcends geography because the state is based both in the Netherlands proper at the Hague and also the local governance structures in Aruba and Curacao. Um, and it also has implications for the management of migration because there is a division of labor of sorts of responsibility for migration management um, between the kingdom, so citizenship is managed by the kingdom government, while local um, administration, so the ministries, the respective ministries and agencies deal with entry and exit. And so where does the Caribbean fall in this literature, which um, for those of us who have been studying this for a while, we know it's a well-established border genre. Um, the US and Mexico border is probably one of the most paradigmatic of this genre. Um, for the Caribbean, as I mentioned earlier, we're not often mentioned in the literature, but there is a, a subsection that looks at the externalization of border management in the region that comes up a lot um, in discussions around um, Haiti in particular, but to an extent, Cuban migration. And in that literature, we see that the region, so border violence is rooted in geopolitics and also biopolitics. So it's the management of um, essentially brown people from, a, from poor countries trying to make their way to the North, um, to other, to other countries, usually the US, um, where there is an, an asymmetric power relation between their country of origin and the country of destination. But what is also not often discussed, and this is something I've been trying to develop, is this paradoxical regional identity because the Caribbean can be considered a space of refuge. We have been home to um, different types of refugee movements going, um, well, preceding the major world wars, but especially, um, I think it would have been the, 
Second World War, where the university where I'm based at now actually housed um, refugees, Jewish refugees at one point in time. So we are the space of refuge. And so um, what, we, what we are hoping to explore today is, has there been a shift from this geography of violence, sorry, ref, refuge to one of, of violence? And so the first um, violent act that I want to discuss is the discursive, which is has to do with the othering of Venezuelan migrants by elites in the political administration of both countries. So you're seeing on the screen a quote from the 2016 throne speech of the governor of um, Curacao, and she describes Venezuelans as, as exclusively people of delinquency who are illegal and who are prostitutes. And this um, language of othering um, stems from the broad classic or sweeping classification of Venezuelans as economic migrants. But it also fits into an, another um, type of othering, which is the criminalization um, of Venezuelans who are perceived as threats to this, the socioeconomic well-being of these two states. And um, if you are able to see that last sentence at the bottom, this is quite early, um, well, fairly early, I would say, because it's it would have been about two years after the, the influx started to become problematic. And the prime minister in Aruba says, we cannot take much more of this, right? So um, this um, violence as speech is complementary to the an active policy of detention and removal, which was highlighted by Amnesty International and Refugees International, um, I think 2017, 18 thereabouts. What is interesting is that since this first amnesty report came out um, late last year, there's this follow up. Still no safety for Venezuelans denied protection in Curacao. And they highlight that authorities continue to deny protection to people fleeing the crisis in Venezuela. So what all of this, these graphics point to is um, interdiction at sea of persons who are trying to arrive in Aruba and Curacao in an undocumented fashion and um, who are summarily detained if they're interdicted and then held for um, very long periods, which are um, periods which are in breach of international norms and standards. Um, and within the context of COVID, those periods have been become excessively longer because the border between those two countries um, have been um, closed. And I can talk about that some more. I don't want to spend too much time in the presentation going through that bit, but the, the closure of the borders has made this situation even more complex. Um, sorry, one second, I'm trying to get this thing out. Okay. Now, um, in addition to this um, active policy of deterrence, so um, the practice I mentioned previously um, there is actually a logic or strategy behind it. Um, officials have actually mentioned it's it's in order to deter persons from coming because if they know if they're that they're interdicted at sea and then deported, less people are likely to travel, right? Um, but in addition to that, the government has actually been um, a little bit tight-lipped. It was difficult for me to get interviews done with public officials. I've written on that. In a, in a reflective piece, um, but um, Amnesty International, which had had access in 2018, what was not allowed access in 2021 to follow up with the government on alleged breaches of human rights. And this um, 
suggests that the government is aware of its violent behavior, but is, okay, I see the, the note. I'm almost done, I think. Let me just do one more slide. All right, um, let's skip that one. We can ask questions about that one. Um, right, so I wanted to talk about this before I wrapped up because I mentioned the fact that the state is multi-layered and the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands has been complicit in this violence against Venezuelan migrants. So the different ways that this is reflected is in a weak protections environment for asylum seekers, but more, even more so is that they have financially um, provided financial and technical support to the detention facilities and um, to border management officials to try to contain this crisis. And they, this is um, operating in tandem with them saying that migration is a local policy, policy issue. So I'll stop there. I don't want to take up any more time, but feel free to ask questions on anything that um, you found interested in the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, thank you. Um, there are already a number of one or two questions that popping up in the in the chat feature, which you might want, or in the Q and A feature rather, which mm -hmm. you might want to have a look at. Um, and we'll come back to that in the in the question and answer period. Uh, the fourth presenter, I think, yes, the fourth is Andre Tim, um, and Andre Tim is a Brazilian writer who has published novels including Insomnia, Insomnia 2011, Modos Incabados de Morer, Unfinished Ways of Dying 2017. And he's also published in Italy and was Premio Sao Paulo, the literature's finalist in the category best novel. Tim's third novel, I think it's his third, he can correct me if I'm wrong, Morta Sul Peste Oeste, Death South, Plague West, 2020, was winner of the 2021 Minuano Literature Prize. In 2018, he also won the Offlip Prize from the Parati International Literary Festival. Andre Tim's presentation is titled Morte Sul Peste Oeste, Haitian Immigration and Gender Violence in Southern Brazil. Andre, over to you. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me well? Okay, uh, from here I will speak in Portuguese. <clears throat> Antes de tudo, eh, eu gostaria Let de agradecer... Let me interrupt you for a second, Andre, just to tell everybody that what I said at the beginning, which is that there's an interpretation feature in your um, screen to the lower right-hand corner, and you may use that um, to if, if you want to get a translation. Sorry, Andre, back to you again. Okay. Antes de tudo, obrigado a Clax pela oportunidade de participar deste painel que trata de temas uh, tão inviting me because these uh, these topics are very important for for our time. Uh, the the question of migration and ref refugees it's a it, it's a it is a conflict in this area in the moment in the moment for instance make this um, a very important topic. The world saw what uh, what happened, what was happening towards the world, and and, and now we have a even more even worse uh, scenario with uh, Russia and Ukraine conflict, with a, a massive amount of refugees, even with people black people being uh, being unable to cross the borders because of the white people that wanted to cross to the EU. It must, it, it must be horrible to have to live into live your, your house and your country to have to to flee the lack of jo uh, lack of jobs, lack of house, lack lack of um, lack of security of you and your uh, people that you love. My name is André Chin. I'm a Brazilian writer. I was born in Brazil, in Porto Alegre. 
the capital of uh, Rio Grande do Sul in the southern part of Brazil. And 17 years, I left my hometown to move to a smaller town called Chapecó, which is in the state of Santa Catarina, also in the southern, the southern uh, part of Brazil. And that's, I am the author of a, a few fact, uh, fiction books. One of them is uh, Morte Sul Pecho Est. The title is, uh, is a phonema play which he talks about the cardinal, north, south, uh, west, east. And then the words in Portuguese, it, it, the romance has two uh, main characters, which are ma uh, the margins of society. And they both uh, experience a lot of aggression. One of them is uh, Dominique, an immigrant from Haiti. Uh, which, which has left his country um, to find a job to provide to his family that uh, remains in in Haiti. To understand a little bit of uh, the story of this this person, this uh, this character, um, Haiti, as you might know, has experienced a, a massive uh, terremote in 2010. And this has started a process of millions of uh, Haitian, Haitian uh, moving to other countries. And even to this day, Haiti is still trying to, um, to uh, recover from it. And in Brazil, there's a lot of people coming from Haiti. And Santa Catarina, that's a place where slaughterhouses uh, uh, offer jobs to these uh, refugees. And since I've been living here since 2004, I could see a lot of refugees coming. And there's, there's a lot of houses We're having a lot of trouble finding uh, 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 labor. So, and so with the good, the good years in the economy in Brazil, a lot of people didn't want to work in, uh, in a lot of, a lot of houses and factories anymore. So, because in, when they are in this position, when they're working in these factories and these slaughterhouses, they have to work with uh, their arms up for many hours and they need to be fast and they have to cut the meat as the meat passes in front of them. Um, there is a lot of uh, injuries uh, and then some people have to retire because of the, the labor. There is a documentary, Carne and Also, uh, Meat and, yeah. Uh, most, most of the refugees ended up in this job because they're, looking, uh, they're really looking for jobs. There's no other opportunities, opportunities for them. And these opportunities in the salary is really low. And it's important to remember uh, to, to bring another puzzle of the piece of the puzzle. And another thing is this, this region that they're coming to, it's a very racist area. It's like one of the actually most uh, racist states in, the, in Brazil. It has the most neo-Nazi cells after Sao Paulo, but Sao Paulo is much smaller population-wise, which means um, so Santa Catarina has a lot more cell na neo-Nazi cells and organizations, in, uh, if you think per capita. Uh, the president, Jair Bolsonaro, had a lot of votes, most of the votes uh, in the state. 260 out of 300 cities. Uh, and the city that I'm talking about, he had 65% 60, of the vote. And then the people that are close to him, which are always con sometimes connected to new na to Nazi move Nazism movement. Uh, when I was writing the process, when I, when I was writing the novel, I was collecting uh, social media uh, comments and posts. And so just to have an idea, I'm gonna read a few of these comments that I get it, I get it. And they might be triggering because there is a lot of hate speech 
and sometimes xenophobic. So com commentary one. It looks like uh, people have uh, are afraid of talking about this race. Sometimes people talk about it, but not many people do. They come from their country just to find uh, trouble, to hustle the women, live like a vagabond. I work with many of these people in Chapico, and and they are demons, lazy, and they are uh, um, they they try to rape the women, and when they complain to the supervisors, nothing happens, and these these people should be deported back to their home. I'm not racist. And I, I know enough to know the topic. They they get a job, but they don't work. The other one is to eat, to fight, and hustle the women. They should disappear, Brazil. Brazil, uh, leave this, these demons to die in their country. And we can do nothing. I'm, I wanted to read some more comments, but I can't do it because of the time. So I'm going to return that. And this, this is the, the context in which Dominic arrived in Brazil. It's fictional, but, uh, but it's a story that's very common to the majority of uh, immigrants arriving in Chapeco. The, the romance uh, narrates this story. He's, uh, he's arrived in his arrival in Brazil and Chapeco and all these uh, degrading situations that he's exposed in the city. There is uh, a tension throughout the book, which is at the same time, which he starts experiencing a lot of difficulties. He also needs to send, he also needs to send money back to Haiti because they, his um, wife is going to lose her house if he doesn't pay the rent. And his, the, position, the position of Dominique connects um, with Brigitte, which is the second um, character. She's trans, her mom is uh, um, addicted to crack. She's a trans, and so she's an immigrant in, in, in her own body. She's exposed to a series of aggression, and, but she has a personality that's uh, intelligent and uh, forward. And so she can come out of a lot of situations. And then at some point, the story of these two characters uh, cross each other. And then and at some point, they just kind of cross. And this process uh, for writing demanded uh, extensive research. And I uh, researched uh, Haitian here. I, I try to be the closest to reality as possible because uh, in a time that we have so much about talking of place of speech, this it's uh, how you build this. This is very important. So I also read some documentaries, some podcasts. I, I the construction of Brigitte also demanded a lot of research on transsexuality. Um, uh, uh, the manuscript was read by a trans person, so I could understand the the construction of the character was very real or close to the to the real. And this was the story of uh, Norte Sul Pestuest. And if you have the opportunity and can speak Portuguese, I'll leave here my invitation so you can uh, explore. Thank you, Andre. Um, and I will definitely have to try to read that novel with a dictionary. Um, but um, it sounds fascinating. Okay, so um, we move on to our final uh, speaker on our panel. And I think we've been going really well. I don't know if I, I put the fear of God into all of my panelists. They all operated well within their framework. But let's move on to John Horn Carter from, uh, and let me introduce him. John Horn Carter is a sociocultural anthropologist whose work focuses on criminality, aesthetics, and politics. 
His research in Central America began in 1997 and explores the reinvention of political subjectivity by criminalized communities, particularly street gangs and their deconstruction of everyday notions of law, beauty, and violence. He's author of Gothic Sovereignty, Street Gangs and Statecraft in Honduras, 2022, published by the University of Texas Press. John's presentation is titled Caravans and Encampments, Fugitive Intimacy in Honduras. Uh, John, over to you. Um, okay, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the invitation to present here today. Um, it's been a fabulous series of papers. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I, I hope I can also look at the PDF at the same time that I'm showing you uh, some slides. Let me, I don't know if I've ever tried to do that, but let's see. Uh, so you're seeing my presentation now? Okay, and then let's go here. Um, all right, if I swipe over to my paper, are you still seeing the presentation or my paper? It's good? Okay. Um, right, so uh, in late summer of 2018, a small group gathered on the central plaza of San Pedro Sula in northern Honduras to travel as undoc undocumented migrants to the U.S. The gr that group, as we know, would become a crowd of thousands flooding over border checkpoints and described as a migrant caravan, a collective fleeing unlivable conditions in Honduras and in which many would describe moments of near utopian solidarity. Uh, international media would frame this caravan and others that followed it as a new phenomenon, a unique expression of a desire for change. But were they the first group to assemble and reject the conditions of late liberal present of the late liberal present in Honduras by literally walking away? There was an important contradiction at the center of the caravan narrative for me. Most claimed that gang violence was their cause for fleeing Honduras, but it was also a fact that a decade and a half earlier, it was gangs themselves who created their own nomadic social worlds in the exteriority of the state. But what gangs in Honduras have become over the last 15 years or so is an immense disappointment to everyone who has watched their evolution from small neighborhood groups to death squads that serve the interests of cartels and hegemonic crime organizations. But for the early gang worlds and those of today's migrant caravans, refashioning of social life in a state of fugitivity is a refusal of late liberal statehood and the cultivation of social practices that turn to a horizon where our current crises ecological and climatological, as well as the familiar economic, social, and political, are incorporated into daily life rather than disavowed from it, creating a clearing in which social transformation parries familiar political channels and assumes a messianic inevitability. In 2019, I was in a bus heading to a rural hamlet in the north coast of Honduras called Loco Mapa. Loco Mapa is one of several locations in the region where uh, local communities are resisting major extraction or infrastructural projects by foreign corporations. Projects that not only would displace local communities, but also irreparably devastate the landscape. Ahead of us, I can see the pickup trucks carrying two coffins of members of the indigenous Tolopan community from Locomapa, who alongside others were struggling to protect ancestral forests. They rely on the title from 1864, despite the state-generated titles issued later to mestizos and landowners, often through acts of corruption. They say that the community agreed to 5,000 meters of forest extraction, but that the company has acquired a contract for 17,000. We spend the afternoon sitting outside in a wake for the two members of the community who have been recently assassinated for their political work. The two coffins at the center are at the center of a circle of maybe 100 people talking quietly. The atmosphere is tense, expectant, with a calm layer of managing things atop a maelstrom that most expect will just get worse. The spot overlooks incredible hillsides, some of which are already logged and clear cut. The company wants, I'm told, to cut all of the forest that we can see. When they do, there will be nothing left, no animals, all the water contaminated, and then they'll burn the hills, forcing everyone and every breathing organism to leave or to die. There in Loco Mapa, where most are now actively anticipating having to voluntarily relocate or else to flee paramilitary squadrons that will be used as a last resort, I feel immersed in a temporality of crisis that most would associate with the Pacific Islands or the bayous of Louisiana, where there is no choice but to accept the world as one knows it, um, 
uh, sorry, where there is no choice but to accept the world that one knows will be underwater soon. In Honduras, the state has approved more than 300 concessions for mining, logging, and hydroelectric projects in the country since 2013. And in the Department of Santa Barbara alone, where I was in Locomapa, there are 96 approved mining concessions, more than 300 under consideration, and 32 approved hydroelectric projects. What strikes me is the way this new reality of crisis comes together, how technological and institutional transformation structures relations between human and material life that across the modern period have been increasing in scope, speed, and impact. How much more can devastating consumption of the world speed up? And yet this pace is also complicated further by the fact that it is not only alarming, but also banal, that it is not just young people coming of age in this moment, but all of us who against our better judgment adjust so quickly to the work of repression, intertwining with technological distractedness that keeps us moving ever more quickly. Where it is said that some of us check our phones more than 100, sometimes 300 times a day, even if we are reading articles about global meltdown itself. How much can all of this speed up? Along Highway 13, on the, back from, on the way back from Locomapa, let me change the slide, there. Uh, on the way back from Locomapa, uh, we stop at another encampment. Now in the Department of Atlantida, where, are, where there are 24 active extraction projects, in the last two years, 22 of them have been halted by peasant resistant groups. Here, a hydroelectric company from Canada has secured contracts and attempted to build a 1.3 megawatt dam last year, adding to the 39 privately owned hydroelectric dams currently in operation across the country. There were major conflicts here on the highway, and now the area is heavily surveilled. The encampment in Pahuiles is a small shelter of plank wood and corrugated metal where banners wave in the wind. The structure is like a schoolhouse, benches on one side and on the other a living space, with a kitchen and a television to watch the news. The television is hidden by a curved metal barrier where two men and a woman watch a national press conference. My friend Albertina has just arrived from a class at a nearby university and while nursing her infant describes the day of the raid. It started at dawn, May 3, a vehicle full of police officers showed up around 5 a.m. in front of the community protest camp, and residents had been present all day and night for more than a year to prevent the machinery from going through. Less than two hours later, the whole area was crawling with hundreds of members of various police units, including the regular National Police Force, the Police Investigations Directorate, the elite SWAT team, and she goes on naming off, you know, an alphabet soup of um, acronyms that are, uh, you know, divisions of different kinds of um, SWAT team police. She describes an event that for me is one of the most unforgettable narratives I've heard in ethnographic fieldwork, in which the company trucks, which, passed past, which pushed past the protesters, made it halfway up the nearby hillside, only to find that someone had placed flaming tires in their path. Unable to turn their heavy trucks around, they had to abandon them right there, where over months ahead, rain would convert hundreds of bags of cement into a hulking block of stone, a monument to futures in which the state, as Albertina has known it, is no longer narrator. As I look up from the banner, as I look up at the banners, I reflect on what the encampment is holding down. The Pahuile sector does not restrict free movement, one banner reads. It only protests uh, for water and with it for life, stop the criminalization. The structure is a statement a mode of occupation in the landscape as the scramble for resources nullifies historical connection to place and puts legal documents under deconstruction and then erasure. Eviction is met with encampment, a mobile practice of dwelling and inhabitation that doesn't need titles and deeds. To caravan or caravaniar and the camp, encampamiento, express evolving relations to land and settlement. The camp is not a fortress or a bunker, not a monument, but a social field a fluid intersection of displacement and aggregation. The encampment is nimble, pitched between breakdown and reassemblage, and in a world striated by conceptual and territorial boundaries that have made it possible to define everything, assign everything of value, and own everything, the encampment atmosphere is electrified with an energy that anthropologists generally associate with transgression. Over the ridge from Pajuiles is another hydroelectric project started in 2017. One has to experience the proximity of these projects to grasp the profound, no turning back sense of finality that drives exploitation at this scale. As we approach the encampment, I can see it in the distance, flapping, 
there we go, flapping um, like a multicolored tunnel built into the windbreak of trees that separates grazing pastures. This is home to the Gilamito Five, individuals who were arrested and charged with land invasion during a protest against the dam, and each of whom believes that they will be convicted under draconian anti-protest laws and sent to the country's newest prison, a supermax-style facility built to house ranking members of street gangs and cartels, but now used to intimidate environmental defenders. As we sit at the entrance, members of the community talk about how it came about. It began, let's see, sorry, I lost my place. Um, it began with a familiar account. The government and a foreign private company were supposed to work with locals in assessing need and impact of the proposed project, but the consultations never happened. As teenagers bring us hot coffee from the open air kitchen and a cool wind blows through the structure, I notice that it has a density, the structure itself, that at the same time feels nimble, also prepared for a world in which mobility has become essential to daily survival. And on that note, I'm told that what brought this group together so tightly uh, was what they consider, um, sorry, what brought this group together so tightly um, that they consider one another no longer neighbors but actually kin was sleeping together in the outdoors, where they found a new awareness of what they were actually defending. First, it was just being with the land, accompanying it in the way that uh, human rights defenders might accompany resistance protesters. But then the routine established a new space beyond the family domicile, beyond the atomized family unit. Everything seemed on the cusp of an earth-shaking transformation, where the cultural and political geography of the colonial period is experiencing obsolescence that is not forced by dislocation and eviction, but by laying claim to those processes and a new sense of citizenship that is what Deleuze and Guattari have called nomadic, beyond state semiotics of territory, embedded in a geophilosophical terrain that precedes and exceeds language, where intimacy can be reimagined. The question of what will become, what sorts of futures we might imagine, is on my mind as I reach Tegucigalpa, where my friend Victor, um, sorry, where my friend Victor lives in one of the outer neighborhoods where gangs and police collude to control everyday life. When I get there, we walk to his home, passing an MS-13 graffiti tag at the top of the street. The group whose menacing presence moved his daughter, Sandra, 21 years old with two small children, to flee the country just a month earlier, seeking shelter with a cousin in Missouri. As Victor and I are catching up, Sandra was released from detention from a detention center in Texas and sent photos to him over Facebook Messenger as she and her two daughters are whizzing down a highway in real time as her cousin drives them back to Missouri. And we're sitting around with, um, well, there's Victor, we're sitting around with two of her uh, friends who have stayed behind who raise animals in their courtyard, um, which uh, they can't leave freely because of local violence. Victor sees the photographs and his eyes well up with tears. The next morning, I'm packing to fly back to the U.S., and I find Sandra's Facebook page has been reactivated, and at the top of it was a new post with a selfie uh, showing her sitting in a yard of tall grass. In the background was an old mobile home with chairs in the yard. It looked to be early afternoon. Her hair was wet, her clothes spotless, like she had taken time to slowly wash off the experience of the last few weeks. She looked exhausted, but serene. In another shot, there's a farm in the distance with a barn and rolling fields for grazing cattle. When I called Sandra that evening, she said that after spending her life in the cramped confines of her family home, the open landscape made her dizzy. We discussed what to do next, and she said that Immigration and Customs Enforcement had put a GPS tracking device on her ankle, and it was humiliating to be seen in public like that. Over the next few months, Sandra would reach out for assistance, contacting activists and lawyers I'd recommended, as well as documented and undocumented migrants in her vicinity who constituted a new social fabric for her. While the caravans leaving Central America are the subject of media accounts and news stories, such movement is only sustainable by emergent communities on the other end. Webs of support not unlike what Donna Haraway calls kin-making. Make kin, not babies, she exclaims, urging the importance of a new family concept beyond that of reproduction or blood ties. This is family for an era of overpopulation, of human global movement, and of violent nationalisms and ostracisms. Kin building as such is cumulative, making possible 
new refuge areas where social practices scuttle past mythologies through which state violence is uncritically naturalized. As Donna Haraway argues, officialized responses to Anthropocenic crises are often top-heavy and bureaucracy-prone and must be dissentered. Revolt needs other forms of action and other stories for solace, inspiration, and effectiveness, she says. May this collection of stories from Honduras become one of them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Um, you can stop sharing now. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to make a quick shout to our audience to the extent that there is um, that if you have any Q&As, now is the time to put them in the list. I just want to say very quickly, however, thanks to all the panelists and to the people, Christina, Alexandria, et cetera, who put this together. This is quite, I think, quite a remarkable uh, panel, and there's a tremendous amount of, of synergy and fusion in how we have crossed um, not only different zones of migration, um, the, the, of course, the traditional Central American migration moving to the North American border to uh, peculiar avenues, the, the Venezuela Curacao uh, dimension, and of course, the Haitian uh, to Brazil, and now uh, within Honduras, uh, an another kind of experience. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's been this, this, this sort of map, um, you know, it, it's almost as though if we were to throw this group together in a room and demand of you that you come up with a general theory of migration and crisis um, and racism and othering and violence, that we might come up with that interesting formula because of the different perspectives that you are bringing. On, on, on the question. Um, but thank you so much. Um, it's not all the time that, that a panel um, actually works. And I think this one definitely, definitely does. Um, let me, do we have any Q&A questions? Okay, well, there are actually a couple of questions in, in my chat feature um, um, for, beginning with ones for Natalie, I think, um, where um, someone asked, CA asked, Natalie, do you have some numbers of Venezuelan immigrants in that region and the period of study? Um, and there's another question for Natalie, which is, hi, Natalie, it might help us to understand the problem better if we had a sense of numbers of refugees in relation to the size of population and physical geography. So those are interrelated. So perhaps we start with that one and take it from those two and take it from there. Natalie? Okay, thanks. Um, so the official discourse on the crisis has been silent on the numbers. And that's actually a very interesting thing to observe. Um, because there is, um, there are a lot of pronouncements about not being able to manage the crisis, but no definitive numbers provided on how many people are arriving. The, um, there was a, a platform established by a number of UN agencies working with some other partners. And the R4V, which is what it stands for in short, has indicated that there are 19,000 Venezuelan migrants and refugees in both Curacao and Aruba. Those are the latest statistics. And I just wanted to put that in context of the population of both countries, because when you work that out, it's roughly 12% of the population in Curacao and 17% in Aruba. So a fairly large portion of the local population, which is part of the, the fueling of the fear, but without a, a disaggregation of migrant versus refugee. Um, it's kind of hard to understand the scale of the problem. I would, however, add to that in 2018, 
a UNHCR official likened the scale of the migration crisis to what's going on in Syria based on the sheer, the scale of, of Aruba and Curacao mm -hmm. and the estimates of numbers arriving. But again, there are no like definitive statistics available. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, actu I actually have a question for, for Esteban, and it's really a question of, of, of the scholarship out there, Esteban. Um, I, you know, I'm a scholar in part of, of contemporary Jamaican politics, mm -hmm. and the, the similarities and cross-references that are, are evident between the movement of of people operating in a kind of civil war or uh, pre-civil war context in the case of Jamaica in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, going to the United States, um, after many of them having purportedly received assistance from the US in their environments and traveling to the United States and becoming criminal gangs is so obviously a parallel. Is there any work that you know of that is being done that is that is examining this 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 um the, the very close interconnection between these two processes, one really in the early 80s and one somewhat a little later? Um not specifically um in this particular area. Maybe John will probably know more about this. Um and you know I'll just say a couple of things but then I would love to listen to John, his research to see what what he's uh, what he's explored. Um, I focus mostly, Brian, um, on the impact that gangs are having with with non gang members. For example, um, in I work with unaccompanied refugee minors, and my research has has been focusing on that. I got interested in in looking at at um, the actual gang members from a, a, a little book by Lu, uh, Valeria Luiselli, um, uh, Tell Me How It Ends, because she's following kids and there's a kid from Honduras in Hempstead, New York. And he said, Hempstead is just a shithole as Tegucigalpa was because the gangs are here, right? <laughs> and so he's trying to stay away from the gangs, but it's really difficult because he left Honduras, his body was, what, was killed, he comes and then they're still there, right? So that's sort of like where, where, where I have, um, I've been working on that, but, I, but you give me a really good idea to start looking at comparisons and to go back a few decades, right? And look at Jamaica. But John, I wonder if, um, I think you will be much better at answering Brian's question. <laughs> no, I, I was gonna ask Brian, could you repeat the first part of it? Cause I, I'm freezing up a little bit. And if, if that's a problem when I'm, I'm answering, I apologize, but no, could you go back to the beginning? Are you talking about like tying up the Cold War moment with the, the present now and thinking gangs across that historical arc? Absolutely. Um, you know, in, I think you've summarized it nicely. I don't know what it is that you thought you missed, but you didn't miss much. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, like for me, it's an obvious um, kind of connection because the, um, the argument that I've tried to make uh, in my work is that um, one can't just think of gangs in a vacuum as like having just come out of Los Angeles or something through deportation that it, you know, it's the real question is like, why do gangs get so much traction back in Honduras? I mean, for me, so then you have to ask where the illicit economy is actually coming from. And, and if one knows the sort of morass of um, conspiracy tales that are attached to the Contra period, then, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, the, it's the cocaine trafficking cartels and their um, collaboration with U.S. authorities that um, really builds that kind of empire that in the, in the moment of transition into the free market, when, you know, wages fall and, and traditional occupations are displaced by, uh, you know, falling import barriers and um, plastic tables from China are meaning that like a child who's father was a table maker for, you know, you know, and his father was a table maker, suddenly uh, leaves the country to find um, work as an und undocumented migrant in the U.S. because those occupations are not passed down. Or you can work in a um, maquiladora or like someplace where you're not paid and, and it's physical abuse um, over a long period of time. Turning to the illicit economy is the obvious um, uh, answer for, for so many young people, but it it's it's sort of um, s the narrative is centered on Colombia, 
rather than thinking about U.S. imperialism and, and what funded uh, um, the Contra War after um, its funds were rescinded by Congress in the U.S. So that, I mean, that's, that's what I look at, the kind of longevity of that um, covert action underworld and its integration into um, what's now the gang world. One of the things that, that strikes me, which, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. I think you've, you've, you've elaborated it. And I do like your example about plastic tables from China versus uh, local craft and the history of that development, how that collapses. And then, it, 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 you know, the person is without a job and without, without a craft. Um, but there's another kind of craft that I'm also interested in, and that is the craft of war. Um, which uh, many, many, uh, certainly from the Jamaican experience, that people were taught the craft of war um, as part of a, 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 an ongoing effort to defeat a democratic socialist government. And then um, when that effort was successful, um, they, they entered um, the US environment, this case on the East Coast, with, with, um, with assets. And the asset is how to operate in 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 uh, in urban in a sort of urban warfare tactical environment, which gave them a head start on other kinds of gangs, which which di didn't have that particular particularly modern craft of war taught to them. So I thought that could be added to the to the mix as something which which needs to be spent a little more time on. Um, there's a question from Natalie to. Uh, I'll, I'll just read it. A question for Samuel on the motivation of an archivist doing research on smuggling and a reflection on the experience of working with people as opposed to documents or other types. Natalie, would you prefer to ask this question rather than me read it out and you're there? No, it's fine. You did a good job reading. Um, so I, I see archival work as it's qualitative research, but it's very different from interacting with people. So I was just wondering how Samuel arrived at his research topic. When, well, my motivation, uh, when I was in my VA, in the, in the last part of my VA, I started to work with uh, immigration uh, topics for for penalize uh, the VA. So, and also my my experience with the region, because uh, we live very, well, I live in a very small town, less than 600 persons or uh, people. So we are, we, since I have memory, I have, I have seen uh, many immigrants in, in Altar. So when I was in the VA, I conducted uh, some another interviews to other kind of of immigrants, but I I always uh, I'm doing something on immigration subjects, and this time was the turn of the of the smuggling. Uh, but but that's it. Uh, obviously, it's a different work. To, to do ethnography with uh, with persons than work with with historical archives, but uh, I'm I'm doing both for now. So, um, Sam, I, I wanted to just uh, follow up on on this notion of storage um, because it struck me that 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 you know storage was such an apt description of the objectification of human beings in, in, um, in, you know, in sort of late capitalism, uh, neoliberalism. Um, you know, you have these packets, you know, it's not people, it's a packet and you store it. And um, it, it, it seems to me that, that there's so much that can be unpacked literally in that concept. And um, I'm, I'm glad you put it on the table. Um, just a comment. I don't know if you want to comment on my comment, but yeah, so I, I just thought it was interesting. Go can, ahead. You, can you repeat the question again? No, I'm just, I, it was really just a comment on your use of, on the way in which the people transporting the people to the border referred to storage. Um, you know, it's, it's an industrialized process of, of storage. 
um, and, and, and how apt, how appropriate that was to uh, describe a particular phenomenon uh, of, of how migrants are viewed, objectified, and treated in this moment. OK. Uh, we are, when I mention discharge, uh, sometimes, well, not sometimes, most of the time when, when people uh, immigrate, uh, try to, well, what about, no, no, no. The smuggling process uh, of immigrants in Alpar, uh, it's through storage by storage by storage. Why the storage? Because uh, I just translated, oh, sorry for the noise. <laughs> I just translated the, the word to, to the English, but, but that's it. That's the way the, the criminal gangs or the mafias hide the immigrants from uh, the Mexican army, first of all, the institutions uh, that, well, the National Mexican Institution for, for Institute for, for Migration and the National War. Because um, since the Trump era, uh, we have a very, very hard uh, immigration policy here in Mexico. So all the all these states uh, in the border with, with the US, uh, have many, many, many around probably 20 checkpoints to, to go to the border. So what do they do? Well, what they do with the immigrants, they hide them from the authorities and put them into storage. Not hotels, not, not other places. It's storages from private uh, uh, properties. Thank you. Um, there, Natalie, you had another question for Andre. You want to say, was that, was that you? Yeah. Yes, I was wondering about the type of research that he conducted in order to prepare the book and whether he had engaged directly with migrants. I'm not sure if he said it, and I'm sorry if, I'm, if I missed it earlier. Uh, Andre, did you get that? What research did you undertake in writing the book? São diferentes fontes de pesquisa. Então, uma linha de pesquisa foi... Are different types of uh, research. One line uh, of my research was the scenario of pre-earthquake and after earthquake in Haiti and what the country becomes after the earthquake. In this sense, I recur a lot of newspapers um, to try to understand Haiti. And now that I found I was interviews, um, as in, uh, in this city, Chapeco, there is a lot of Haitians. Uh, I, I went to interview them to understand their uh, life stories. Um, uh, after earthquake, those stores are very alike. They see each other without condition to provide their families and they need to find the subsist substance uh, way to provide their families. The documentary that I mentioned, uh, it's flesh and bone. It's a, a, a good found, it's very important uh, because uh, describes the reality and the environment in these meat um, packing plants because is necessary to understand that happens in the industrial level. It's not a small meat packing plants or a meat house are huge industries and they need uh, all the time a lot of uh, uh, or workers, a lot of workers working for them. So this kind of research was I, what I used to build the character of Dominique uh, and other source of um, research was what I did to construct the character of Brigitte. In this sense, uh, I used documentaries, 
was, uh, I, I don't remember all the names because or a, a series of documentaries that I use as well, TV series, uh, articles about sexuality. And when the book was ready, I, I got to, I, I gave the manuscript to, to a transsexual person to say if this character was built in the in a fit the dignity way in a precisely way, uh, because I didn't want to to, uh, to to take the risk to incur uh, some traces uh, of personality that is not in the environment of a transsexual person. Do we have any other questions that anybody <laughs> I just wanted to mention too, following that, um, that commentary, um, Andre, I appreciate your, you mentioning the, the documentary, um, Flesh and Bone, because I don't know if you're familiar in Iowa in 2008, there was one of the largest raids at a meatpacking uh, factory or a meatpacking plant um, where ICE came and arrested close to 400 Guatemalan immigrants. Uh, and there's, there's a couple documentaries that came out of that abuse, the post-build raid, and later on um, the U-turn because the filmmaker, a Guatemalan filmmaker, Luis Sargueta, followed the story, learned how the community in Postville and adjacent towns in Iowa got organized um, and over the course of, of eight years, he continued to follow the story until many of them received the U visa for because of the abuses that they had that they had gone through in the meatpacking plant years years later. So I found found it to be really fascinating in the same time period, just about in Iowa with Guatemalans and in Brazil with Haitians, how the meatpacking industry right is just is just an area of a field of exploitation and, and, and violence that I think could be could be could be pursued uh, further. So thank you for that. Interessante, Esteban. Não tinha muito, conhecido. Muito interessante, Esteban. Não, não sabia desse documentário. Yeah. I will have a look at it. Thank you so much for this because they happen at the same time of my research. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I I thanks for that, Esteban and. Patsy, I see you have your hand up. Um, thanks. I thought it was be quick. You need quicker. to unmute. Can't you hear me? Oh. I just, I just want to. I wanted to ask. hear me can you hear me yeah yeah I Okay, great. Um, so um, no luck with that. Um, if, if we still have a few minutes before our time is up. So if you do manage to sort of the problem, uh, we can probably take 
um, one more question. Does anybody from the panel wish to say? Hold on, can you hear me now? Right, you're fine now, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear. I, do, I wanted to ask Natalie, because she described different levels of governance between um, in the, within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, between the autonomous territories of Uber and Curaçao and the, the um, Netherlands government. What are the responsibilities for migration? Is there any you know, responsibility for Holland to what's happening and the management of migration in the islands? Um, so that question has been perplexing legal scholars, constitutional scholars, um, and persons like me trying to understand the issue. Um, the constitution and the, well, the kingdom charter, which is what establishes the relationship between the kingdom government and the autonomous countries, um, specifies certain responsibilities for the kingdom government. That includes foreign policy um, and management of citizenship issues. So that's specified in the kingdom charter. What the kingdom government has argued is that this particular crisis is a local issue that should be handled by the local authorities. And the reason that the constitutional scholars have raised alarm bells is in the charter, there's also an article, I think it's article 43, that says where human rights are being abused, the kingdom government has a, a responsibility to step in and address the human rights abuses. And so that is where um, the, the meat of the matter is because the, while the kingdom government has provided technical and financial support for border management, it has basically legitimized securitization of the issue and is not addressing the human rights concern, which is the um, provision of, uh, well, review of asylum requests and, and award of um, refugee status, if that is deemed appropriate by the, the local authorities. It's a very complex um, issue, but hopefully that um, sheds some light on the question. You're muted, Prof. Meet. Yes, and uh, thank you, Natalie. Um, any other questions or comments from our presenters or from the floor? Well, in, in, which, in which case, uh, I just want to underline again in closing that this was a fascinating panel. Um, I, I don't know what the um, organizers' plans are for bringing this together as uh, maybe an edited collection, but I see all of these fitting together uh, in, you know, in terms of empirical work, ethnological work, um, in, in terms of Andre's work as a novelist um, in a very rich and textured uh, series of conversations about the state and the really um, you know, sad state of forced migration with all of the accompanying features that go with it. But also, and particularly in, in John Horn Carter's um, final presentation, which brought out uh, perhaps most graphically the resistance to um, you know, conditions of extreme um, othering which exists in these communities. So I, I, I thank again our organizers for um, the entire seminar, but especially for this panel, because I think it worked. And it, it has certainly opened my mind to, to some of the work that is going on in this space. And hopefully we won't see the last of this work and it, it would appear together as a whole at some point in time. Thank you so much. 
and um, may you have a great afternoon and remainder of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye.
Muy buena tarde, jóvenes. Buenas tardes, John Gerardo, ¿cómo estás? I'm doing it. ¿No se escucha? Ahora sí. ¿No se escucha? Muy buena tarde, ¿sí me escuchan? Sí, ¿nos escuchan nosotras? No. Buenas tardes, señor. Kristen? Buenas tardes. Kristen, how are you? This is Lilia Castañeda, the interpreter speaking. Um, you know, I followed the link, but it got me in as a as a panelist, which means um, that I don't have interpretation. Eh, and buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Buenas sí, tardes, sí, señor. Eh, sí, señor. Really, ahorita, ahorita uh, vamos a... Yo, yo no escucho. ¿Me escucha a mí? Ahora me van a pasar la interpretación. Ah, perfecto. Mil gracias. Acaba de decir. Ah, Gerardo, empezamos en 10 minutos. No, no le escucho nada. Eh, está, ha subido en... Eh, no sé. Espera. Estamos viendo ¿Qué, ¿Qué problema tendré? Tengo abierta la... El micrófono. Parece que usted tiene cerrado su micrófono. Parece Ahora bien. sí. Ahora Pero me aún no la escucho. Eh, y si cierro y vuelvo a abrir, a ver. ¿Eh? Ahora cómo cierro. <ríe> ya. Yeah. Deje ver cómo está mi micrófono. Ya no fue necesario abrir. A ver, hoy sí. Sí, te escucho. ¿Me escucha a mí? Sí, ahora sí. Te estaba ah, bueno, ah, bueno. apagado el micrófono, de, pero de la computadora. Ah, ya. Bueno, ya estamos. Sí. Entonces, vamos a esperar que, que se junta el resto y. Y sí. iniciamos la Muy bien. Bueno, muchas Ustedes, gracias. Es un gusto. Es Kristen. Sí, así es. En castellano, español, ¿qué, ¿cómo es? ¿Cristina? Bueno, Kristen. Ah, ok, tal cual. Yeah. Oiga, una, una preguntota y inquietud de su servidor. Eh, está, le comentaba a Eric, que es con quien contacté que ahí en el cartel me habían puesto por parte de la Secretaría de Trabajo del Gobierno del Estado de Puebla, ¿verdad? Sin embargo, le comentaba a Eric que eh, a partir del día 28 de noviembre presenté mi renuncia a la Secretaría. Entonces, tengo que aclarar eso porque incluso puede ser un problema legal. Ah, ya. Lo, lo cambiamos eh, hoy mismo en el, en el sitio de web. Sí, y simplemente, pues, como educador popular, ¿Verdad? Y sí puedo comentar el trabajo que hicimos ahí en su momento, si hubiera necesidad o alguna inquietud o pregunta. Claro. Sí, pero... pero es...
A ver, tenemos aquí los y las diferentes participantes de, de la mesa y también eh, <coughs> tenemos opciones también para la, el, el intérprete. So, uh, hi everybody, We're, we have some options for interpretation from Spanish to English today. Um, feel free to look into that. Um, there should be some options here on the screen. Um, <clears throat> With that, I think we'll give, we have another um, panelist who should be signing in, who's not quite here. So let me make sure they're not having some problems. Tenemos otra persona que va a estar así participando. Vamos a esperar un poco. I see Casa just joined us. Hey, Eric, I think we need to get started. So why don't you go ahead and introduce the panel in the first person, and then we can add whoever is missing in a bit. Okay, just one more second. Our fourth participant here is asking for the link, so let me attend to that. So for those of you who are listening at home, the title of this panel is Economic Alternatives and Resilience. Okay, I believe he now has the link. Mutual Aid, Worker-Owned um, Cooperatives. Bueno, and gracias por estar aquí todos y, y todas. Thank Estamos. you so much for being with us. This is the Sawyer Seminar panel dealing on several topics, um, such as mutual health, cooperativism within the context of crisis. And I am here to moderate the session. I'm Eric Larson, Associate Professor in the Massachusetts Dartmouth University, and I also work here with uh, projects promoting economic alternatives, cooperativism, cooperatives, and other sorts of mutual aid. Uh, I am very am happy to be with you today. It's a big pleasure. It's an honor. But we have two participants today. One of them is still joining us, joining in. And we will give um, there's no participant access to our panel. Let me give you a profile of what we will talk about today. We have two uh, perspectives of organizations that are working within the United States, and we have as well two outlooks of people who are working in Mexico. So 
uh, and of course the topic is migration violence and we will be seeing this topic with uh, different perspectives now first of all then let's start by lorenzo cata lorenzo cata catalina lorenzo is um would like to have her bio in english but she is the director of the alliance to mobilize our resistance amor she is a mayan woman from um, the mountains of guatemala she was the, the first person of her family and of her people to graduate from the university in guatemala catalina worked for a human rights organization for women um, indigenous rights and uh, social justice and uh, then she moved to Rhode Island and she is working as a, a community organizer from June 2017. Also, she is active and she has an international network of people, migrants from Guatemala, from her own uh, region. And she is uh, the person in charge of a radio program that is broadcast uh, in the United States and in Guatemala. So, well, Kappa, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, well, we give you the floor. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, uh, colleagues. And my thanks to everyone this afternoon joining us. Amazingly, well, this is like two years ago, right? That COVID took us by surprise, I say, because we have heard much about many diseases in other countries, but we never thought that we would be hit. And however, now we are all in this same basket. So I'm grateful for being here. And I will talk about my experience working in the United States with an organization that is called AMOR. AMOR means Alliance to Mobilize Resistance, and it works here in Rhode Island. This is a small state, but also with a very large uh, Latin community or, or Spanish speakers, many of them Guatemalans, uh, many of them members of the indigenous community. So despite of the fact that we have moved to a different place, we keep our roots um, and our language. And despite of the fact that I am no longer in Guatemala, as it all got to Guatemala, we understand um, kind of like the two parts um, perspective or outlook on how things are changing. Everybody knows that it was a big fight. They locked us up in the COVID pandemic and it did not affect everyone alike. I understand that there are different peoples with different privileges. And the, unfortunately, the hardest hit community was the low income one. That is people with no resources um, and a proper place to live to be in lockdown because usually in the migrant community, life is difficult because you start from scratch. You start by renting a room or maybe a tiny apartment or living with a very large family. And this affected in terms that it was difficult to be isolated. The kids had to be locked up in a very small room. There was no yard for them to play. Uh, that was very difficult, uh, very tough on their mental health. But also you just couldn't uh, keep social distancing. And because of the migration situation that not everybody has a a banking account that is full of money. You know, uh, most of our migrants don't have money to uh, cope with any emergency. So people had to go out and work despite of the pandemic or the virus, they didn't care because at the end of the month, they had to pay for the rental. First of all, the, the rental fee, and then of course food, you know, people get hungry and, and, and then you need to eat. So that tended to happen a lot. And what my organization did was that well, actually, we have a hotline and people call for support. Well, 
one Friday afternoon, the state was in lockdown and the phone started to ring endlessly and the community learned the phone number. And so we were answering all of the phones uh, of people asking for support, um, asking what to do, asking for um, support and information. So in one single week, we developed a structure to um, distribute food, um, everything that was necessary, alcohol to sanitize their hands, chlorine, um, children's food, uh, food for everyone. Uh, we um, prepared rations with beans and, and food that is not only food. We know that culturally we eat some things, uh, beans, um, uh, tortilla flour, chocolate, rice, not just because we want to uh, distribute food, we would give any sort of food. We had to give what people are used to eating. And it was not only food, it was informing people on the situation because it was a complete chaos. We immediately translated the information to seven languages. Of course, Spanish was easier, but we also had to consider other languages of other countries. Where I live, um, many people come from there, so we did it quite fast. And I had never, I, um, Amor, and myself had never been in any um, crisis situation like this one. So uh, we realized that this can be done if people get together. We kept the mutual aid project for almost a whole year, running every day. And last year, it was quite low. It was just um, extra. This was the approach. In addition to meals, uh, are more provided face masks, sanit uh, sanitation sa uh, project um, products, etc. But there was also the problem of having to pay for the rental fee. At least in the United States, there was support from the government, the stimulus check, the so-called stimulus check for your family economy. Some people that have certain um, privileges did get the funds, so we bought a, a, a big sum of money and we started distributing it among uh, the different people that were entitled to it. At the beginning, we didn't know much what we were doing, but we were very positive. So um, we started developing in, um, a formulary uh, if the person was single or it was a whole household on how to distribute the money. But at the end, we didn't have enough, so we had to lower the amount. At the beginning, we gave $2,000 to a large household. Uh, but then we said, how much can we can we give? So we bring, brought the money down immediately. I know one of the girls received a large sum like that of money, and she said, well, I will live uh, on this money. I will keep one half. And I would send, um, I would ship uh, the other half to my hometown because they're living in a very difficult situation. Um, and of course, the experience, uh, other reflections on the same is that COVID, yes, it hit us. But in fact, people, after the fact, people continue to have economic issues, um, food safety issues, there's no food safety still. A lot of people still don't have um, enough food for every day. I mean, we're not talking, not even about um, a house. Uh, some people have a roof, but they just don't have income enough to be able to buy food. And we're not talking about uh, not even, you know, nutritional food. We are just talking about food to fill, uh, to fill the tummy up. So it's difficult, it is just not enough. Uh, people are not being able to met to make ends meet. And we realize that there are also large organizations. Um, Amor is a, a community level size, but some other organizations distribute money, I mean food. And we realized that they didn't have a good distribution channel because they give where they can. And it so happens that when people have no driver's license and no car, they just don't get the food. And if we're talking about the United States or at least in the area where I live, there's times at winter when there's no one, it's a whole disaster. 
um, in streets, people cannot go out. So it's senseless to get the food if, if, if you cannot uh, take it to wh wherever people need it. So there are lessons learned from all of this and that perhaps for little by little we're learning, we're working to see how, uh, for instance, the food distributors will make more small uh, organizations divided by um, neighborhoods, perhaps. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I am skipping and skipping so that I can complete my lecture. Well, you still have a few minutes, but, you know, have it your way. So that's it. The limitations is language, transportation, um, and of course time, because if people work, sometimes they work, and Raul will talk about this, if people work for many long hours and they get a very small income and they get home very late uh, and they still need support for work because when you're a migrant and you have, you're undocumented, uh, and especially if you have kids, well, uh, you will have access to some benefits, but if you have no kids, if you are only adults, you have no benefits of any sort. And so therefore you need to, they need to uh, c c supplement their income somehow to afford um, every month's expense. And, and it is a lot and people just don't make it. And also we realize that there are elderly people that are also document, undocumented, that's even worse because they either don't work or they work um, on a daily basis. Uh, there's no security, no um, guaranteed income for the month, um, no money for medications, no money for um, e medical expenses. That makes that becomes even more complicated. And if they have no relatives here, it's really tough. That's when I, what I can say and now linking this to the situation of people uh, in their original, in their native countries. Some shipments, well, families, households can no longer send any any shipments uh, or any um, money uh, home because they can hardly um, support themselves. And they don't receive any support uh, and the, 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 from the government or from no one else, they, they just say you have to be quarantined. And, and this is why many families have no longer been sent, sending remittances. Now I know that they're getting support. Um, um, now it's becoming more efficient, but in the past people suffered. And we also heard comments about people who said, um, uh, neighbor such and such, and I went to, see him and, and give him soup. So that's very nice to hear that the members of the community itself were supporting each other, although they were not relatives or they were not kin somehow. That was, that was a good thing. Also churches participated a great deal, helping out, providing food. And I know that religion is a completely different story, but however, they always support and they offer their facilities for distributing food. And, and, and that is a great support. As I said, this is going to continue. People are still in need. And I say it because I realize that we have gone through the worst part of the pandemic, but people still are having to cope with a difficult situation. And we only realize that they suffer twice as much as people having a higher income or having economic stability. Not all of them can get to that economic stability because eventually, irrespectively of how many years you've lived it for in the States, you need many other things in order to have an income. You know, documents more than anything. If you have no documents, life is hard. Now, if you have any specific questions, I know there's going to be question section. Um, and of course, I will have a chance to answer to your questions then. Well, thank you so much, Kata, for this perspective that discusses work in the United States, but also in a transnational community. The 
hurdles and the benefits of mutual aid. Okay, let's move on. If Gerardo Alba Castillo is in agreement, in order to have the Mexican experience of alternatives so that people would not need to migrate if they don't want to. Gerardo Alba Castilla. Castillo graduated from the University of Guadalajara, Mexico. He is a poet and has worked in different contexts of solidarious economy in Mexico, microcredits um, at some point, uh, uh, but more recently in the labor in ministry of the state of Puebla, where he was ed educating cooperativists in uh, popular education processes. And he has uh, devoted himself for a long time to popular education. So welcome, Gerardo. Welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Eric, um, colleagues, all. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And uh, I should say that recently it was necessary to present my resignation at the labor ministry. I worked there for two years. There was an administration change decided by the governor and our colleague Abelardo Cuellar Delgado, with whom I entered the labor ministry, was um, destituted and they appointed a new administration within the labor ministry. And it's, this is quite normal in Mexico that when there is a change um, of this kind, um, white collars come out and no people arrive. So I worked there for two years and we worked on something that has made me feel very proud of myself. I can give you some information such as that when we started to work in the state of Puebla, we had 481 co-ops according information from INEGI in Mexico. And at the end of the period, two years, we managed, we succeeded in training and constituting 109 additional co-ops. This means that today in the state of Puebla, we have 590 co-ops. The work we carried out was based on the, um, the training of a training team. We, we were five colleagues who were uh, educators in cooperativism and solidarious economy. All of us having had popular education training before that. Other activity that we carried out, among others, we had 120 basic uh, workshops on cooperativism. Some were online. We had to summarize them to six hours because sometimes it is quite tiresome to work online, especially when you're not used to it. For us, it was a need and a novelty because of the pandemic. And uh, the workshop lasted for 18 hours or, or usually last for 18 hours. So this is the work that we carried out. The workshop is made up of four modules. The first two have to do with sensitization and, and group integration. The second part, we talked about a little bit of the story we recovered part of the story of cooperativism in Mexico, of what it implies organizing a cooperative and its um, structures, and also the formal process to notarize co-ops. And together with cooperativist uh, training, cooperators training, um, where there was a program that was called Let's Train cooperators, we don't know what will happen with it, but it was with a very holistic character. We started by training cooperators and we started um, offering educators in cooperativism. 
we consider that from the moment um, that cooperativism in Mexico emerged, I don't know about the story of other countries, but I think that one of the major weaknesses um, of cooperatives was the training of cooperators themselves. This is an important element to consider that the identity of cooperatives, their philosophy, their ideology is as a function of the principles and basis of cooperativism that are uh, have reached a, a global consensus and they have been developed uh, from the first moment uh, when the concept of cooperativism was coined globally. Um, there are many cooperative practices, um, um, but uh, the organization of uh, economic uh, um, owners, uh, common owners, was originated in uh, England in Rochdale. I hope I pronounced it well. I don't speak English. But I hope I said it right, Rochdale in, in England. I believe this was in 1934, December the 21st. Uh, a group of unemployed textile workers got organized to create the first cooperative in the world. They developed a consumption or consumer cooperative, which was so successful to, to the point um, that it lasted for 10 years. And uh, this topic has been developed ever since. And uh, this extent this was spread internationally. Among those people who participated in the first international co-op, there was a lady, and this is important to know because we talk often about the principles of cooperativism, but to mention that in our country, for instance, in, in Mexico, only in 1953, Two years before I was born, and I say this haphazardly, women were given the right to vote, but already from the very first co-op that was um, created in Rochdale, this lady that participated, that was just one, had equal rights than everybody else, than all of the other 20 members. And she has a right to vote like everybody else, voting right. So we will talk more about democracy uh, within co-ops um, stemming from their principles and values, the, its principles and values. Now, considering the importance of cooperators to the extent that the culture that permeated and has continued to trickle down as of the neoliberal project in Mexico does not foster cooperation or solidarity, but quite the opposite. It fosters competition, selfishness, uh, individualism. I remember when I was a teenager, they, they, people tended to say that we um, were members of underdevelopment because of individual will, but I have learned along the path that the release of our people is not the release of an individual, but the, rela the release of a community, a collectivity. And in that respect, we can talk about release or, or liberation. When, when I talk about liberation, um, of course, I am aware of the catastrophes that the neoliberal project uh, caused in Mexico, that there was a great deal of corruption from the state and from um, uh, the private initiative, large private companies. Today, this is being um, fought off and we're experiencing in our country a transformation process headed by our president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, that has as main core fighting of corruption. And in that respect, the social agenda of the country of the federal government has uh, determined, as I said, a social agenda, but trying that resources that I channel to the population uh, be sent to the more, uh, the population more in need and that they get there without any middlemanship. Many organizations and foundations have been um, 
actually eliminated. I think that NGOs in Mexico were corrupted because they have many administrative uh, leaders, good salaries for the leaders, but very few resources got to uh, the people themselves. So the current government has um, take to, taken it upon him, it, itself to make the funds reach um, the grassroots. And it may be stated that the government has a slogan, for the good of everyone, let's benefit the have-nots. So this is actually the mantra of the president among the things, the other things that we did in, in our ministry. We had a, a forum every fortnight, every Saturday, and it was called Cooperative World Forum and for in favor of solidarious cooperatives and for the well, for, for living well. We had 36 forums, um, 20 of the first year, 16 last year. And we had an, an outreach of about 46,000 people in the different forums. We invited from the higher president of the board of cooperativism and, and very iconic people. Um, such as the Pascual Cooperative, the Cruz Azul Cooperative, um, and greeting our colleague, Mr. Bonifacio. Well, he is from the Tosepan Cooperative, one of the most iconic cooperatives of the state of Puebla. They were born more than 40 years ago. He will talk to us later on, but they were born with a consumer consumption cooperative uh, and now there are more than a million uh, cooperatives so this is part of the work we carried out and I think we provided a little over 120 introductory lectures on cooperativism I call them um, during lectures to attract people to cooperative the cooperative movement um, they allowed us to learn um, how close was the spirit of cooperativism um, to the spirit of people. And within this dialogue, we started to recover a collaborative experiences of collaboration, community experiences, our fellow, um, our colleague Catalina knows them well because in Guatemala and in the Southern port of part of Mexico, we have a tremendous cultural wealth of, of um, community traditions that are essential for the work of cooperativism itself. And asking people if they knew about any cooperative practice or if they had participated in it, trying to clarify things a little bit. Well, quite likely in Guatemala, there will be the techio which is the equivalent of um, the cooperative. We have the barter or, or tueque. Uh, there's a practice that is called la bozona. The concept is very close from um, cooperativism. This, well, actually the concept consists in that if my house is collapsing, I can summon my friends and neighbors to help me rebuild and I commit to feed them. We have already clarified that even voluntary work requires um, material uh, consideration. You give food to who helps and builds, but you also get the commitment to collaborate with whomever will need it within the community ever since. So there's a, an important amount of community and collaborative practices in our native peoples. Now in the original, in the classic case of Puebla, there are seven languages um, spoken of seven different nations. There's a great deal of wealth and tradition and the historical memory that for us is essential. We don't want this to get lost. Um, and in fact, within cooperativism and solidarious economy, well, there is precisely the proposal of recovering and preserving or preserving and recovering historical memory and the traditions of our peoples. Mexico 
um, in general, but um, Puebla more specifically has a very long lasting historical memory, but as of the um, indigenous peoples, the native communities, I, I repeat that only in Puebla, we have seven languages uh, spoken from seven different nations. So when you are aware of what a cooperative is, a, a cooperative starts from three elemental principles. One of them is your own effort, mutual aid and solidarity, going beyond uh, many other principles within uh, cooperativism. A cooperative is formed from a partnership among people to solve their needs uh, of every sort, economic, social, cultural, etc. And this is an organization of workers of common property. This is the key. In Mexico, we have the general law on cooperative societies that collect the demands of the cooperative movement. And um, I would like to mention that whenever there has been interference of the state or other entities within the framework of cooperativism, counter reforms have been enacted later on reforms as of 2013 a reform was enacted um, of the cooperative society act where a law was created to regulate the credit unions a law that we consider to be prohibitive to popular savings and also very aggressive and with the involvement of the state in within cooperativism so that the banking commission uh, the mexican sec is now regulating um, loans within communities i would say that this is completely um and uh, unnecessary because the the community uh, and the, the cooperative is self-managed so when we were there we took it upon ourselves to respect the autonomy and the uh, freedom and liberty of the co-ops, but in order to close talking about the programs, well, in addition to education, um, a series of sub-programs were enforced. The first part of them was to support the notarization of, um, of cooperatives before notary publics. They um, agreed in, in collecting only 4,000 pesos plus value, value, value added tax for the notarization process. In our country, it may be stated that public notaries um, charge from 6,000 all the way up to 20,000 in order to notarize a, um, a, an incorporation um, paper. But beyond that, the agreement by our secretary in terms of the government's uh, resources and those with the, the, the Ministry of, our Ministry of Labor plus the government subsidized the cost, which means that for the people it was free of charge to notarize their um, cooperative. The second program was to provide professional technical training to cooperators. There was a one more sub program that was related to support in equipment, tooling, and machinery. It was of about 130,000 pesos, Mexican pesos. And finally, we were not able to complete it as we would have liked it and as we had planned it. But there was one more sub-program which was entitled RAS, meaning self-employment and solidarious support networks. This program intended to provide 200,000 Mexican pesos to cooperators to install a little mom and pop so that there the products of the micro um, companies could be offered there. Uh, all of them um, craft, arts and crafts of the, of the region could be sold in that small store. 
So between 2000 and 2006, I participated in Mexico City in a program of microloans where we also promoted the cooperativism and solidarious economy. Microloans have their has its origin in the gaming bank of Med Junos, although with adaptations and uh, uh, adjustments to our own reality, loans were given in a very, very uh, soft way to collectivities of up to five people. This allowed us to promote as well cooperativism and solidarious economy. In a region of Mexico City, we managed to create a committee, the so-called fifth son of solidarious economy. And we managed to hold up to five fairs of solidarious economy with more than 130 exhibitors in the south of Mexico City. This was also an enriching experience that allowed me to learn little by little and uh, um, become more and more involved in solidarious economy. Well, Gerardo, I would just like to remind you about uh, the time. Yes, I'm closing here. The basic pedagogic principle for us was that participation is a right. The process is dialogical and the questioning is the method of teaching. And we start from the, the idea that he who teaches learns and him who learns also can teach and share collective knowledge. This was based on Paulo Freire's pedagogy. Um, and then I would close here. Perhaps in the Q&A session, I can talk about the principles and values. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we will move on with Raul Figueroa. But I wanted to say that thanks to your virtual forums, that Gerardo's team and uh, other people organized. This is how I got in touch with their work. You know, they did it on Facebook Live and uh, there were numerous people attending. So thank you so much for that great work. Okay, so next comes Raul Figueroa. I uh, have the great honor of having worked with Raul on cooperatives in uh, Rhode Island. And he is the cooperative coordinator in the labor force organization and has been so for many years. This organization and Raul's efforts, I would say, are your, are, um, this is just the most important example on promotion of cooperatives here in the state, especially cooperatives for the working class and um, migrants. So thank you so much. And we have Raul with us and uh, let me turn it over to him. Well, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you for inviting me. Gerardo, what a great job uh, you did talking about Mexico. Um, a great appreciation for your hard work and uh, well, based on what our friend Gerardo said, I would like to give you an outlook on cooperatives in Rhode Island. But before that, I was born in El Salvador. I was born there in 1980. This was during the Civil War uh, and it lasted 11 years. So I saw my dad as a union leader always attending demonstrations and always uh, working side by side uh, the grassroots. And I learned a lot from the fight, from unions. And then I moved here in 2000. I've been living here for 22 years now. I worked as a chef for 15 years, my last job was teaching people that had just uh, 
um, inmates that had just been released from prison, teaching them how to cook and allowing them to become reintegrated into society. And I did that for seven years. Then in 2016, after the last administration decided to go into politics. And so I decided to work as a community coordinator, working much closer with Latin people, because at the time there were many attacks to the Hispanic community in the United States. So I have been working in Fuerza Laboral, labor force from 2016. We focus on migrants, workers who are exploited every day throughout the United States. There is a great deal of exploitation, just as Kata said, this is my same experience that we have seen with people, people who need the job, people who are in, in a moment of uh, great vulnerability. And so Fuerza Laboral decided to provide a, a, a more permanent response to labor abuse. And we did it through co-ops. In 2017, we introduced a legislation to acknowledge cooperatives as a legal entity, which was not the case in the past. And so ever since we started to build the topic of cooperativism and the culture of cooperativism, Gerardo talked about the principles, those principles have prevailed and have been a part of cooperatives for over 175 years from the very cooperative that was founded. And uh, this is also our educational access and our basis, we're based on democracy, cooperativism, and obviously here, cooperatives up to now have not flourished and have not managed to thrive as much as in Puebla. Up to now, there's only about 20 to 25 altogether, but it has grown much from 2017 when the legislation was passed and people have started to use this model more and more in order to become incorporated. And we have been a part of all of them, helped in education, um, providing guidance, um, um, legal interpretation, etc. So we have been a part well, in some of the co-ops, we were there already at their beginning, in their inception, and in some others, we've been a part, uh, helping them in, in well, later on to, to thrive. Now, the problem here is that we live, we all live in a world that is cap capitalistic and, and, and um, consumeristic, but in the United States, in Rhode Island, I believe is this is one of the largest enemies that co-ops have. Because as cooperatives are very few, they have to compete against companies that pay for prices that exploit workers. So the consumer, well, not everyone, but most con consumers prefer to buy uh, products or services that are cheaper, less expensive. So our market is smaller than that of those co-ops uh, or, or those businesses. We focus on responsible consumers, those consumers who want to make sure that their money is going to um, a good cause and that their money is going to be circulating in the local community and that their money will be invested in the welfare of workers so that has been our approach and that has been part of our education ever since we started out with co-ops. The good thing about all of this is that co-ops exist and are going in many other industries, many other industries that in the past had never considered 
uh, creating cooperatives. What's more, there are some businesses that are that belong to one single owner that have converted to co-ops. That is, they have been bought out by uh, workers and that have become a cooperative. If you are aware of the cooperative history, well, in Argentina, something like that happened in the year 2000. Many factories closed their doors, many industries closed their doors, and so workers were laid off. The owners took the money away and they expropriated uh, the country and, and, and they left. So the workers took a part of those co-ops and they started to produce, but now in a different way, now for the sole benefit of the workers. And so this is what happened with, with this, which is a, a cafeteria quite different from what you can see in Argentina, right? But it, it has the same concept. They decided and they saw that the business was to be bought I mean, sold, and they decided to turn it into a co-op. And this has also been useful as an example for other people who want to do the same. Obviously, co-ops are not for everyone. If the person does not believe in uh, cooperative principles, or if they simply want to be the sole owner and for the rules to be followed by everyone, well, that is not the right person to be a part of a cooperative. Co-op people need to know how to work as a team and for the sole benefit of the members. And not the cooperative, but also providing a service which is responsible, which is necessary to the community, not just creating co cooperatives for the sake of it, but rather cooperatives, as Gerardo said, are created because there are some things that are not being provided by other businesses on met needs by the government or by the private initiative. So the people get together and create these services or products to meet this need for the benefit of the community. Obviously, the, the topic of cooperativism, well, we have adopted a lot of the work that has been done before in Spain, in Italy, in Colombia, in Venezuela, Argentina, Mexico, of course, but we have to adapt that and, and, and really um, tailor uh, or, or custom make it to our local uh, situation. So education is constant. We have educational programs all year long. Sometimes one of the things that happens is that sometimes we we say, well, let's organize a workshop or a class and 20 people um, enroll and uh, only one person shows up. No problem, that person is given the training and then that person comes back and then the group starts to go. So the issue is that a lot of people want to see that somebody somebody else will take the first step and then they will be followers which is okay and although it may be disappointing you know um, organizing so much and working so hard for a workshop and for just one person to show up but it can be really disappointing but we use this as a motivator to work harder and we educate the worker that has never been acquainted with cooperatives before, as well as a person that is um, a legislator or a governor or a mayor and all of the people from municipalities that are maybe not familiar with cooperatives either. So we use the same method, the same system, and we invest as much time as necessary for people to understand because the more people who understand that this is a true possibility, then we are sowing this, the, the seed in more and more minds. So this is something that requires of a long time, a, a lot of dedication, devotion, you know, long hours. 
because a lot of people with whom we work are workers themselves. They work all day long. So oftentimes we have to hold these meetings um, late at night or late in the afternoon or during the weekend to adapt ourselves to their um, spare times. So we sacrifice ourselves much because we all have a family. We all have a life of our own. And at times, you know, this is um, in addition to the other jobs that we, that we have. And many times we don't talk about this because you, you kind of can feel desperate. Of course, we, we love what we do and we dedicate the necessary time to it, but we have to be aware of the fact that if we are advocating for and, and motivating people um, to have a better life, a better quality of life, for them to really take the reins of their economy, for them to be able to find new alternatives and economic stability. We also have to remember that we are a part. We are a part of that group. And well, we have to apply the same philosophy to us. During COVID time, a lot of people realized that the places where they were working, those companies that told them, you are a part of our family, and they had them working day in and day out, but they suddenly realized that this was not so. This was a big lie, a big fat lie. And when the reality arrived and, and you know, um, they were, of course, the first to be laid off. And so just as uh, Catalina's group did, we also um, obtained funds to be able to provide an economic um, aid to people so that they could pay their bills and, and, and give them food. But we also used that chance to show them that within the system we were before, what the system was simply not working, or, or I should say it works well for those people who, for whom it should work, but for those people who need it most, it just doesn't work. And uh, this is a topic that we have discussed once over and over and over again. And uh, this has been a slow process, but at the end of the day, people have been able to understand and they have also learned that, well, yes, cooperatives is an alternative to the system that had them working for so long. In, in this case, of course, for migrants, migrant workers that are undocumented, being a worker has certain risks, obviously, because we're working with no permits, no documents, and, and this sets them in a position that the employer can abuse them. But as a co-op, in order to be the owner of your own business, you don't need any documents. So this is a much bigger opportunity to become stabilized, to work regularly without any need, to become um, exposed to the risk of being undocumented. And also by doing it together, it is a lot easier than doing just one person alone because the minimum wage is scarcely $12.60 in Rhode Island. Um, well, you, you spend it in maybe one or two pounds of beans. So if you make the minimum wage, it's almost impossible for that person to have sufficient income to start your own company. And in addition to that, there's our families in our own countries that require aid. We have to support them. And if you make the minimum wage, it becomes so difficult for a person. But of course, for several uh, people, all those um, savings get together and are pulled and with the different pathways and the guidelines, guidance that we give them, the work becomes more affordable, more accessible to create their own co-op. And although we still are moving slowly, minds have been open to this new possibility 
and a lot of people are now talking. For instance, they're asking for more education, more aid, and we continue to be able to provide the help or the aid in, in a free of charge manner because we have managed to obtain grants, subsidios. We have managed to get help from foundations uh, from different places to be able to provide those services to the community. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And in fact, Gerardo, I would like for Eric to get us, you and I in touch so that we can chat because I think it's wonderful what you're doing and I wish to learn from what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raul. And uh, well, with the time that's left, we have Raul next. I mean, after Raul, we have Bonifacio Iturbide, who also has a paper. Bonifacio Iturbide Palomo is with us. He is a member of the Tosepan Titaltanisque Co-op and has worked in it in its location of San Antonio Rayon Jojotla Puebla for 41 years. He was the uh, mayor and left the, the, he was also the, the registrar of San Antonio Rayon for um, many years. He was a part of the administration, um, bo the board of administrators of the Rayon uh, Tita Tenisque, a cooperative and the union of Tita Tenisque cooperatives from 2001 to 2016. Ever since 2010, he became a member of the, the Rayo Tosepan and Maxchum board uh, within the Tosepan cooperatives of wh where he is the CEO and legal representative and with different strategies promotes uh, the knowledge and conservation of the Masewala and Tutunaku peoples. Has become a promoter of uh, an educator uh, at an indigenous level. Autonomy with uh, cooperativism. Has participating in community um, mobile telephony um, in addition to Tosepa Radio. So thank you so much. Well, Bonifacio is with us. And so I will share my screen for you to talk to us about your topics this afternoon. Thank you. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a todas. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone. To Catherine, to Eric. And to the attendees. I appreciate this invitation. Can you please share my screen, Eric? Okay, it's being shared. Well, our organization. Well, this is a tiny clay pot where a kind of a bee, the Mexican bee can be seen. And we use it uh, for representation purposes because just as these bees organize around a clay pot to make honey that uh, is uh, nutritional and, and healing even. The community also has powers. I apologize and I am in our community, so 
it's a noisy area. This is the map of the Mexican Republic. We are located in the state of Puebla. You can see the larger circle and the northern and eastern mountain ranges of Puebla and uh, those municipalities, five of them are from the northern coast of the state of Veracruz. This is our location. Next one, please. We are, we speak Nahuatl, uh, as Gerardo, the Nahuatl and the Totonaca uh, nations in this region. We acknowledge Nahuatl speakers as the Masewalme speakers. This is the municipality where we are located. There are 432 local co-ops. Uh, in 34 municipal, well, it used to be 34, now it's 35 municipalities. We have 432 local cooperatives. What is a local cooperative? Well, it's a group of people who, in each of these 432 local co-ops, get together in an assembly once every month. And uh, those co local co-ops, each of them within their own community, has a committee uh, the, the committee includes the uh, chairperson, the secretary, the treasurer. Every time there is an assembly, they write minutes. In those assemblies, they discuss problems of the community, and uh, then they make decisions. Uh, they take oaths, and uh, they finally uh, bring the results in re to regional assemblies. We have. Uh, seven different uh, regional assemblies. We started up in, in uh, many years ago in Jose de Tatenisque in 1977. And at present, we are made up by 42,000 members or even more uh, cooperators. And more than 70% of the people uh, within the 430 local co-ops or 432 speak the Nahuatl or Totonacur language uh, and Masewal. And another important thing is that at present, 64% of uh, the attendees to assemblies are women. At the beginning, it was mostly men who attended at the assemblies, but now we are working on gender equality and now our assemblies have a higher presence of women than of men. Thank you very much. This is our objective to improve the quality of life from the family of the members and that make up the organization. And working in, in, in order to give them a good life in our language, we call this jegnemilis. A good life implies in with all of the processes that co-ops, local co-ops and the union co-ops have carried out. The intention is to develop healthy production, healthy nutrition, caring for mother earth, as we call it here, caring for the environment in addition to the social environment caring as well for the social and environment, the social and the physical environment, caring for the good life, wherein within our, in, within, in our own communities, we may live happily. And uh, we will discuss later on, how can we live happily? What does this mean to live happily? In addition, we have strategic objectives. Number one, is for members to have a sustainable home. We work in a dwelling program so that members, in addition to be able to produce their own foodstuffs, that they can even take advantage of technologies. We're using, for instance, solar panels and um, wastewater treatment or taking advantage of rainwater by means of different um, uh, geotechniques and also 
Melitona uh, or Mexican B work or stoves that spare uh, the, the house from smoke and to produce um, the foodstuffs that we consume here to become self-sufficient. Under number two, we work in different cooperatives so that members of those co-ops to be able to derive income that is healthy and appropriate to their needs, uh, of the needs of those that are members of the co-ops, providing families an opportunity. Well, if we talk a little bit about education, those who generated the Tose Pantataratanisque co-op 41 years ago, we just turned 41 in February, 2022. Uh, 21, 41 years of cooperative life, and they practically were unable to read or write at the time in 1977. As uh, was mentioned a minute ago, there was a need for basic staples. And this was found because there was a group of technicians from the Plan Sacapuastla plan promoted by the government and they, these technicians arrived to the field to try and provide new technologies. And what they found is that when they organized the assemblies with the Masewala group, they found very uh, little response. So they thought that it would be interesting to listen instead of talking. And ever since that, that became the new methodology and, and actually the core of the and methodology in our assemblies, we discuss, we hear, and we propose. Ever since the methodology was created, consisting in that the assembly is the soul of the Tesepan and methodology is to wonder, discuss um, the problems, propose solutions, and maybe we're not in agreement in, in some projects that the state promotes, but we still promote how would we like to carry the project out. This is why the individual and collective skills are so important to be developed and developed ever more within the organization, considering different strategies. Next one, please. Objective number four. is something that we worked a lot with in Radio Tosepan uh, by means of capsules interviews. We try to achieve what item number four says, that it, we, we strengthen, reinforce uh, our culture and knowledge, the Nahuatl and Totonaca cultures. That is crucial for us because there are so many media that report uh, about the region in Spanish, but what happens within our communities, our specific problems, our proposals, what we have to do it ourselves. And in fact, this is done as can be seen in the next objective with children, boys and girls. We have a school that um, encompasses from kindergarten to high school using the Ministry of Education's model, but also adding cooperativism classes so that boys and girls who are the sons or daughters of members will be imbued of this cooperativist uh, spirit of their forefathers. And this is how that, that, that this, it is thus that we try to make men and women live um, uh, in under equal conditions and, and happily. Some time ago, we had this strategical that was slightly specific, but ever since 2020, we started to realize by different means that the territory was a concession, especially for mining and we were unaware of this. So this is a map indicating the project, not only regionally or locally, but 
nationally to see how concession uh, our territory has been for um, oil or hydroelectrical project. This is a great risk for the region because the mining legislation, for instance, defines that the subsoil, irrespectively of what it is there, whether there is um, pepper or healing plants of any sort, or gold will always be more important for the state to exploit that gold or that energy source. So we have promoted through a lot of work with sister organizations, not only the social model of cooperatives, but also the legal one. And we have even presented a uh, legal suit um, number one, to cancel all mining projects that were granted without the agreement or the knowledge of the native peoples, as is set forth in Agreement 169 of the International Labor Organization that this country has undersigned. There's also our Magna Charter, the, our constitution that sets forth uh, this right. So we have promoted the legal aspects we have had a choose as a mining project was just uh, canceled in the Cotitem, the concession, but also here in Quetzalan in 2018. It was impossible for the higher court of justice to fail in favor of giving the priority of native peoples in their territory depending on what there is in their territory. But this is our goal, to defend our territory. And of all of these projects, uh, instead of selling, we build, we build life plans within the territory. And a life plan is not specifically uh, forecast in a large document. So we live here every day. We talk our language. We consume our own foodstuffs in a clean manner because the avalanche of the market products that arrive globally through the telephone, internet, uh, TV, radio, are very strong topics. And our peoples really are carried away by the mass communication media. Well, I think I have already explained uh, what's in this next slide. Uh, I am being told, Eric, that we just have a couple of minutes left, so I would like to move on to the next slide and close with it. Uh, I would like to state that we are nine cooperatives and we work uh, with different products and services. This is our presentation and our flow chart for the organization as Radio Tetzepan. We are at the center and we are in the communication um, uh, segment. Through our cooperative, what we do is to educate, train, support youths that can learn any social entrepreneurship, um, allowing them to evolve in in a cooperative, either in microfinances or in organic production or in bamboo production and processing or in coffee and pepper production and processing or in uh, taking advantage of the melipona bee honey. In all of them, in all of these cooperatives, we work with youngsters with a goal in mind that we can get employment that is dignified, that is fair, and we can survive within our territory, within our land. So I think that this is the end of my presentation. Uh, please put up the next one, Eric, and with it, I will close my presentation. 
Well, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I think there's a lot to talk about, but I would like to close by saying that we work much in training youngsters in my area. We have seven youngsters that are, that are working, as I said, in, in community, a mobile telephony in, uh, we are the virtual mobile operator of internet services through MiFi and through mobile chips and through radio communication. We have three young ladies and four young men who are working in radio communication. And there are many more youngsters in all of the other co-ops. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, Gerardo. And my thanks to the University of Brown for giving us the opportunity to share with you what we have been doing in 45 years. Well, thank you so much, Bonifacio. And as you said, there's a lot to talk about and very little time as always. Well, this is the time when we ask the audience for questions. The coordinators here of the four have told me that we have to close at 5.15. So unfortunately, we will have no much chance to discuss some of the topics collectively. But the questions from the audience, if you have any questions, if you wish to ask the panelists, you can do it through the panel, I mean, through the chat. And in the meantime, well, there is a brief question for Kata. Kata, my thanks to Gerardo for talking about the collective work, the La Cosona in Oaxaca, Oaxacan communities. And I wanted to ask you whether in migrant communities here at El Moral, if you see us as well, um, this kind of work, construction work, and how does that impact your activities? Is mutual aid useful? Uh, how does it help to defend the community? Um. <laughs> well, I think it is uh, practiced less. One thing is that this country teaches you to do other things, just as Raul said, capitalism. He, here, for instance, we don't know our neighbors. We don't trust them because who knows who they are? Even if they're immigrants, we find it diff difficult to develop um, trust and also labor exploitation, as Raul said quite correctly. They, I said that they work long hours, but this is actually labor exploitation. They can't work for just eight hours, but many more. And all of this makes it very reduced the, you know, uh, interaction. And if you go into this world of capitalism, wherein if I want to visit you, I need to get an appointment in my community. I'm there and I see you there and, and, and you ask me in and you give me coffee and we have a great time. But things are different here. Things, everything are, are planned. Uh, everything needs to be um, with an appointment uh, according to your agenda, because otherwise if you go anywhere, you will not find anyone there. So the only common thing that you see here is in when people are moving, because I, I also, have benefited from it. When people are moving to from one place to the next, we call everyone and everybody supports their neighbor to move. Or there, there are different things. When somebody passes away, um, a lot of funds are collected to send the body of the um, deceased person back home. Perhaps this is manifested in a different way, but if somebody does not have any food, yes, the, the line, uh, does run. I think it works, but in a different way, in a different way, but it does exist. Mutual aid, that is. Thank you, Papa. Well, it seems there are no questions from the audience. We have uh, just uh, maybe three minutes left. I don't know if any of you as panelists have any comments or fin final questions. Well, for starters, my apology, because 
you know, I elaborated too long. I got carried away. But I should say as well that in Mexico, we have serious poverty problems and, of course, labor exploitation. We can say that in Mexico, as well as in Chile and in Brazil, we have one of the largest uh, concentrations of um, income because 10% of its population got a very high percentage of the total country's income, depending on the 2021 program of the United States, uh, of the United Nations uh, for development purposes. And, and this situation of income concentration, for instance, Puebla ranks fourth in terms of poverty um, index. There's Chapa, Oaxaca, Guerrero, and then Puebla. Puebla comes fourth. And to tell you that in the same proportion that wealth has increased uh, in the hands of, of capitalists, to that same extent, poverty in our state has gone up as well. And this is definitely the causes of migration, the poverty conditions, and in some cases, or on, on safety, on safety that started to develop itself and, and was triggered from the government of Felipe Calderón, who, according to him, challenged the criminals, but uh, at the expense of triggering, uh, waging a war, a public war. What's more, um, the minister of um, war is in prison today because he has been linked to the to the um, drug trafficking. So this is a great deal of selfishness that causes this. In addition to this, the pandemic has brought upon the states and the country very sad situations. This is what forces people to migrate in, in search for better living conditions. And hence, we have um, actually decided to work as cooperators to offer uh, a job that is dignified, a job that would not only benefit the worker himself or herself, but the, the benefit of the whole cooperative, of the cooperative at large. We always say that the co-op has no for-profit nature. And so they say, well, then why should we work if we are not going to generate any wealth? Well, the proposal is that we work for the common good. That starts even by questioning consumerism. The proposal is to be ethical, critical, and responsible consumers and then to start assessing what we produce ourselves and what na nature gives us and to leave aside um, junk food that provides great gains to transnationals. Very good. Well, thank you, Gerardo. My thanks to everyone. So we are closing today. This is the end of our module. Before you go, I just want to. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Why isn't it working? Yes, microphone apagado. I think your audio is on mute. I know, but it can't. Yeah, but it's not. Can you hear me? Oh, OK. Thank you. I just wanted to, to add my thanks to Eric for this uh, um, really very interesting um, panel. We had, we do not often hear um, much discussion about cooperatives and, uh, you know, alternatives to the, the main economic model. So thank you um, for that. Also, um, Thank you for Katarina and Raul for um, bringing it close to home here in, in Providence. We really appreciate um, all that you have brought to the discussions. And of course, thank you to Eric for organizing this really incredible panel. I just wanted to remind those of you who are here at Brown that um, in a few minutes at 5.30, we have the exhibition Breaking Out Immigrant Art from Stewart Detention Center. Please join us at the ground floor of the Watson Institute, um, 101 Thayer Street. 
I also want to remind you that we start at nine o'clock tomorrow and, um, you know, just introductory um, comments make, and the first solid panel will be at 9.30, Migrants Identity Shaping Their New Homes Through Development. Um, also, I want to remind you that in the um, later on, we have uh, um, the panel Literatura de la Dias Diaspora entre Migración Forzada, Forzada y Violencia de Género, Literature from the Diaspora Between Forced Migration and Gender Violence, which is, um, which is hybrid, and that's at 5.30 tomorrow. So please take a look at our program, because of course there are panels between that first event and the last, and we're really looking forward to seeing you all again. And again, thank you so very much. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas felicidades por estos. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations. Congratulations on this work that you do. We are so happy to know that there's empathy elsewhere and that we can work together. And we'll keep in touch, of course. Uh, Eric, can you please give him my contact information? And Eric, um, I will have my phone ready as of tomorrow. But in Facebook, you can definitely find me or in Telegram. Okay, thank you. Congratulations, Catherine. Bye-bye. <laughs>